All right, everyone. Um, so welcome and thank you so much for grabbing the reins. Uh, I'm your host, Eric Wahlberg, and today I'm with Alpha Barry. Alpha, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me, man. Great to meet you. Awesome. So I'll give you a little bit of an intro and then feel free to, and I want to first start by thanking you. Alpha, this is the easiest interview to prepare for because Alpha has the most, you know, robust no notion page about like everything that you would want to cover with him all in one place. I'm definitely sealing this as a concept. I know people have done this, but it just made this whole process incredibly, incredibly easy. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, no so worries. Alpa, you, you studied philosophy at a, at a school that I, I really uh, enjoyed. My grandmother was one of the first women to go there. College of oh, wow. William and Mary, you studied philosophy there. Mm -hmm. um, and while there, I know you, you learned product design, you launched a peer to p a P2P marketplace uh, for the college students, which I think is super cool. Previously, you worked at uh, LACI, which is a clean tech uh, incubator uh, connected to the city of Los Angeles, I believe. Yeah. Um, and uh, and now is building new worlds at Junto, which I know we will get. Uh, we will definitely be talking about um, Alpha. Anything that you want to maybe d dig into in terms of your your introduction? I mean, I certainly will also uh, talk about you know your, your your values, maybe some of your ten. Uh, or your uh, uh, things that you want to accomplish in 10 years, but anything that the, the audience should know about yourself before we get started? Yeah, never quite know where to start with these, like, you know, what's your background story? So I'll just start at the beginning. At the and very tell you your origin story. I left, I also left your origin story open. For yeah, you. yeah, yeah, right, right. So, so I guess, so I was, I was born in Ivory Coast. I'm American, but I was, I was actually born in Ivory Coast. Um, and I lived there for the first eight years of my life. You know, it was a pretty like bourgeois, like upper middle class, you know, existence. Uh, which kind of like got shattered as soon as you know the the civil war happened in two, 2002 which was i think uh when, when you talk about like origin stories as, as, I, as i put it to me that's like you know that's the bruce wayne batman moment <laughs> yeah where there's like a clear before and after and yeah. so so we, we 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 lived in senegal afterwards for about five years as refugees um and then you know uh found a way to get to the u.s through through, through my parents who had like connections in the states you know did the process legally, became citizens, and then afterwards, I just, uh, that's where I got into to high school, uh, you know, started to think about what exactly can I do to leverage this opportunity, because, like, a lot of my peers and friends, you know, perished in the war, like, our, our neighbors as well, so, like, I was like, okay, this is a pretty privileged situation to be in, how do you maximize this, <laughs> you know what I mean, and so I got into College of Women Mary, uh, originally, I wanted to get into law, but, and so that's what, that's what philosophy was the spark of, but, you know, like my senior year, a few, a few of my friends, we, we really started to get to, we, we started to see, you know, all these stories about Snapchat and like all these 20 year olds building empires basically out of, out of nothing. And I was like, okay, something is happening here. Uh, yeah. And like it, law seems like a, a, an old technology, something to be uh, ignoring when, when you have like basically uh, technological empires birthing themselves out of, out of Silicon Valley. And so we wanted to get into that space. So that's where the, the marketplace uh, came up. We launched uh, a website. Basically, it's like eBay for college students, right? It's like yeah. a very derivative idea. We just wanted to, to try something out. And, and, and it worked. We, it, we had some traction, you know, got some users, made, made a little bit of money, not much. But then right after that, I was like, okay, this is fun. I can, you know, we can yeah. make shit with our own hands. I don't need to, you know, beg anybody for money or anything like that. So, so after, right after that, we, we graduated. We said, okay, let's build our own thing. We're going to be the next, you know, the next big guys, right? The next Mark Zuckerberg and, and, and Elon Musk, whatever. And uh, we weren't <laughs> because our idea was, <laughs> was trash. Our idea was trash. We were like, we were, we were trying, it wasn't trash, but the idea was to build a, a podcast aggregator because mm -hmm. the whole idea was if you can, if you can basically own the demand in the podcast space, which we, we thought was going to be way bigger than it was back then, which it turned out to be true. But, you know, so the idea was to basically build the YouTube of that, of that space. Um, mm -hmm. the, the problem of course, is we, we were a little bit early and also we just weren't the right, the right people to build this thing. Um, so we did that for two years and, you know, it, it was, it was a learning experience. So right after that, got into into Lacey uh, while I was you know studying uh, at the new school in New York City um, and and yeah I did that for for the last year and then uh, yeah now I'm working on Junto. <laughs> Super cool yeah, yeah. no I, I, I can certainly um, I don't know what it would be in your case I won't speak for you but 
So, you know, I, I, start, I founded my first company when I was 17. Um, oh, wow. You know, it was a, it was a grub hub, but based around farmer's markets, um, okay. which, were, which were booming um, in New York uh, circa 2011. Um, you know, uh, maybe for some of the New Yorkers, this will mean something more than for, for others. Um, but when, like, I was at Smorgasbord when there was like, like three Stellas, you know, <laughs> okay. and, and like just the beginning of it. And so I yeah. um, did it with a, a, a co-founder of mine that was thir 30 in his 30s. And I was, mm. you know, 17. Huge mistake to kind of mismatch yeah. that one. Yeah. We were the first B Corp, uh, triple bottom line in, 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 in New York. Um, really? I thought was that was a, cool a do, and it was a great starter. In New York? So oh, okay, I bet New York, that, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Just in New York, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we, uh, it was a great learning experience. You know, went, I literally went to every single farmer's market in New York, went stall to stall to stall to try to convince these, you know, multi-generational farmers and so on, you know, yeah. not only to go brick and mortar, but then now to go like delivery. And, right. Um, but uh, just to say that um, anyone who's been a, a young man, knows how confident and like you know the, the yeah. i would say for me it was hubris i mean there's just um it's and always I just, hubris. Uh, yeah it's always <laughs> hubris and i um and it was it's always so much harder than you think it is um yeah. and but 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 you learn and i think what i'm gathering from from you and i i like to think that i got there eventually as well probably took longer for me than for you but like having the ability to reflect on that and acknowledge that is super powerful right um, yeah for sure yeah cool all right um I want to rewind, you touch on it briefly, but I want to tease it out, but mm -hmm. it's in your, um, your values uh, and I'm going to butcher this, um, but noblesse oblige, how do I, how do I say this? In oh, uh, no, yeah, noblesse oblige, it's, it's a French. Noblesse oblige. I should just say, so you know, just so you know, I'm the only person in my family that doesn't speak French. Uh, my, 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 my family, <laughs> my family is from like Switzerland. My, okay. my, my family speaks French, like going long, long ways back. But um, anyway, uh, I'm very, very, I very much appreciate um, this concept, especially in the context of, of your, your, your origin story. I, I will tell you, um, for me, grew up basically as privileged as you can be. Granted, you could have gone two generations back and my grandmother's fleeing the Nazis, but like yeah, yeah. That, that, that feeling of, I really think that that's missing in the upper middle class and, and upper classes right. of the country at, at scale. Yeah. First of all, just talk about the concept. What does it mean mm -hmm. to you? Um, where, how do you think people can acknowledge this? And, and you know, yeah. I, and I'll, I'll just say, but I'll start you with the fact that I think right now, there the only way that people have tried to do this is through like shaming people or the the right. or the um the billionaire the weapon, like conversation the, thing billionaire yeah. that or the weaponization of the term privileged and yeah, how, yeah, yeah. how 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 um, non functional or just how not unproductive that is. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So there's a whole genealogy to this idea. So noblesse oblige is basically um, a, a French idea of like the ancien regime for 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 the, the whole French kingdom. And the idea was basically that the, arist the aristocracy and the, and the nobility had a kind of uh, privilege that came, that, sorry, responsibility that came with a privilege. So like for all the power, it's basically the, the Spider-Man principle, right? For all the power you have, there's like a lot of responsibility that comes with it. And, and the so it's, it's kind of a, a weird idea to think about, like, why were, you know, all these Roman consuls uh, dying during the, the Punic Wars? Like, why were their, their heads of states basically going out to war and fighting, like, hordes of, oh, like, you know, Nordic, European white men, and, et cetera? And, and the, the concept basically is that you could say that essentially every elite or aristocracy or nobility is downstream from a technology of ambition, right? And like, this is this idea that Matt Clifford developed the technology of ambition is anything that accelerates the power of capital of any ambitious people in their era. And so for, for most human history, that technology ambition was war, right? And so, um, it, in, so like, you can think about the way elites were established is you had all these young men with like their, their companions and their, their, their friends uh, banding together to get land, to acquire territory, to expand their power and their, and their wealth. And so when, once they acquired those things to legitimize their, their power and, and, and nobility, they, they had to um, basically form alliances with like a clerical order. And at the same time, this legitimacy meant that you had like a, a kind of responsibility that came with it. You know what I mean? So like now you weren't just the guy who, you know, 
killed my neighbor and, and took over my land, but now you're, you're, you're ordained by God, you have a mandate of heaven, right? So now you're, you're a custodian of this, of this land, of this empire. And so you, you see that in all these arist aristocratic warrior, warrior um, societies, like for example, in, in, in Greece, they had, ancient Greece, they had the whole idea of uh, arete, which was, you know, th this concept of like virtuous excellence. Right in Rome, they have the, the whole idea of virtus, right? And, and and of course, in France, noblesse oblige. And then, even even dating back to like Napoleonic era, like you had mm -hmm. the, the the martial corps. They had um you know every marshal had like a staff, and inscribed on it was this Latin saying, um, "Terror belli decus pacis," which means terror in war, ornament in peace. And, and the whole idea is we were the nobility right we go out there we defend in peace we provide like we, we create this wonderful like beautiful existence like i mean versailles is is exactly you know a manifestation of this impulse and so so for about most of history that was the case and now what happened is over the last two or three hundred years actually maybe longer than that you had the industrial revolution and so mm -hmm. and so what that created is is a, a new kind of technology of ambition where now the unit of acquiring power and capital is not necessarily the military or the army, it's the company, right? You have like Rockefeller, you have, you know, the Robert Barons, all these people basically um, upstaging the old, you know, um, sort of like warrior class. I mean, in America, you would think that we never really had an elite, but yeah. uh, that, that's, 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 it's actually not through to mythology, right? Like if you, if you think about the founding of America, the founding far, fathers were the elite essentially. And what they yeah. were, even, even between them, they weren't just, um, they weren't just, you know, as the woke, like so the woke continue like to say old white men, there was a right. tremendous amount of diversity uh, even in that, in that elite. It was like, you had the Normans on, in the South, right? The Cavalier yeah. Normans in the South and the Anglo-Saxons in the North. Like right. just that alone is a there's a huge history behind that. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, I think, you, you, want, um, you want to interject? No, ahead. I just wanted to say because I think that that people don't um, understand. I read um, this book by I'm trying to remember the title. It's on my bookshelf, and I'm looking, and I don't have good enough eyesight to find it. Um, but it was uh, Alan Greenspan wrote it, and he wrote it with somebody else, and he, it's a thorough uh, right. exploration of the economy and history of the United States of America. And he, they talk about the immigration, the waves of immigrants as they kind of, or settlers and so on. But, and people don't realize it's, people don't realize, and I think it's a, it is a, it is the result of kind of living in a multicultural civilization today. But like, you, you know, if, you, if back then, if you said somebody, you know, it's like somebody who was Norman or somebody who was Anglo-Saxon, they knew the difference between each other. Yeah, like yeah, exactly. they could tell the difference between each other. Today, we've used the racial category of white to, to lump all of those people in together. Yeah. But but rest assured that in 17, you know, you know, 60, they, they, they could tell the difference. And, and I mean, and the, the manner of them, I mean, the Irish Scots that took over right. Appalachia, those people were crazy. I mean, the, yeah. I mean, they were very robustious. They had a very different quality to the, you know, the gentry of the Anglo-Saxons. And I just don't think that that history is appreciated. Um, and, and, but, and, and, but yes, I, I, I cut you off. Go ahead, can infinite if you want yeah, to sorry. continue. Yeah, so I only brought all that, the whole like genealogy, basically just to say that, so the American elite was, um, was the Normans, basically. It was the Normans and yeah. the Anglo-Saxons, but if you know the history between those two, like, you know, Hastings 1066, what happened? Right. You know, the, the, the Saxons got their asses whooped by the Normans, right? That's right. what happened. And, the, and, they, and they, lost, they lost their land, right? And so I, there's this guy, I don't know, maybe that's too, there's this guy called, his name is Mitchell Heisman. He wrote this 2000 page uh, book of like complete bonkers ideas called the suicide note. Um, it's a suicide note, he, he killed himself. But, but wow. it's, it, it's, full, it's full of extremely interesting stuff. That's where I got all, the, all, all, all this, uh, this stuff about the Anglo-Saxon and Normans. And his idea was basically that um, the American founding was a way for the Anglo-Saxons to recover their tradition mm. before the Norman conquest. Right. Mm. And so I don't want to get too into the weeds of that, but the whole idea when you think about it is that you had this competing elite founding this country. One had a very old warrior uh, tradition. It was the Normans, right? They were the conquerors. Right. They had this whole idea of noblesse, oblige, and all that stuff. And you can see it in the way that the South developed. They had this whole, you know, this weird, like almost honor and yeah, yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. 
Like if you watch Gun, Gun with the Wind right now, like you, you'll be like, what the fuck is this? It's not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, oh, but the oh, Anglo-Saxons were completely, you know, they were like bourgeois, you know, like kind of like industrious Protestant, you know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, and so and so that divide, all this to bring it back to the noblesse oblige idea is that after the Civil War, well, when basically the Saxons conquered the Normans, um, you had basically the, the whole Saxon ethos went out over that whole, you know, noblesse oblige idea and add to that the whole industrial revolution effect. So this whole concept of what nobility is supposed to be and the, the, the responsibilities that come with them completely evaporated. So I think that's fascinating. And, and since you lined it up and I, um, you know, th- uh, in terms of the civil war being that kind of, that key transition of, of, of power, yeah. one of the things that was created in, during the civil war was the ability for affluent people to pay for somebody to serve in their stead. That's right, a very right. non yeah. noblesse oblige concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I wonder if that's really, you know, because in the United States, as you mentioned, you know, we do not have there there we have war heroes you know we've got our our patents and our marshals and all of that and and they're great men but they're they're not a, there's not you know there's not a lieutenant dan culture where like everyone right. has served in the you know we don't have a warrior culture um in yeah, the united states yeah. of america um we send our lower middle class people we use our military often as a, as a means for you know social socioeconomic uh yeah. uh maneuvering upwards which is a great thing but you know there's I mean, I can speak from uh, experience. I went to a, I went to a public school, but a public school in a very, very affluent suburb. And right. Marine, I think it was the Marine Corps recruiters came to do a presentation. The snobbery, like the nose being lifted <laughs> up at these people, like it's like we're all going to college, like we're gonna go right, to right. like, and we're going to, you know, the idea that God, you know, it, and I remember that serve so at all, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And that's that's very very interesting to me, um, and the fact that there's that historical, and then I mean you you look at you know, and it's interesting because there was, if you think about one of the reasons and one okay so then World War II, America right. really has this tremendous outpouring of power wealth conquers the world in many ways, yeah, and everyone served in that war, yeah yeah, women that, included. That's interesting. Yeah, you know, well, but like you know elites sent their sons to die. I mean, it was, it was a noble enough cause. It was a worthy enough cause. And, and, mm-hmm. and then like, that's the last time you really saw like this concept, I think in many ways, because then you had Vietnam people, you yeah. know, Trump out that's... his way out of that, you know, I mean, right. and, and, and J- John JFK is actually a, a great, or John Kerry are actually great examples of people who come from very, you know, distinct, especially John Kerry. I mean, John Kerry is a Brahmin New Englander. Um, Right, right. So, so anyway, the, I find that yeah, all actually, very that, that's, that's that's interesting. I didn't want to gloss over the fact. So, like, obviously, the wasps, right, are a uh, Anglo-Saxon stock, and like they they sort of maintain that whole concept, right? Like the the whole idea of, you know, the 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 wasp who basically goes to Yale and like serves in like the OSS, and you know, goes out like you know have like Tennyson in his pocket when he goes out and to, yeah. I don't know fucking yeah yeah yeah. Shit. So I mean that that was a real phenomenon, but what happened is i don't think we need to, we should under underestimate the power of like the industrial revolution and how and the market revolution actually which the industrial revolution was a mm-hmm. part of right that right. that brought up all these the you know these people who came from nothing basically and had no concept of this they they were optimizing for for just money right for for money right. and for security which is a very bourgeois um you know notion of life they weren't interested in like so, so what does an nobility care about? They care about, you know, glory, like, you know, fucking mattering and doing it, things that are, that, are, that are great. But like, if you're someone who comes from a, from a lower class background, you just want security, right? Which is understandable, by the way, it's nothing to scoff at. But when those people of become course. your elite, uh, you lose something. And I think that's what happened over the last, and it's very rare, I wanna emphasize that, it's only about 150 years old because, because think about it throughout history it's just this warrior caste you know always dominating and like by the way there's there's also downsides to that as well i don't want to point paint like paint this as like a glorious, of course no no no, no, no. Of bullshit. Course. yeah there's, yeah, there's yeah, downside yeah, yeah. to that but 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 what happened was they would they would use that technology of ambition war and then 
turn into the service of states, right? They, they would become statesmen. They, they wouldn't just remain just warriors their, their entire lives. And so that's why you have like guys like Caesar, you know, conquering Gaul, he goes back and he just rules, right? He's just a right. competent administrator, right? So there's that whole culture of statesmanship. And I think that's what we're losing with our new elites where they just make a lot of money. They're good at building companies, but they don't bake in this whole idea of being of service to your state, right? Like Elon Musk right. doesn't even think about going into into politics or like becoming oh, a he'll, he'll, he'll play the federal system against itself right i mean he's exactly gonna yeah. he has, absolutely i can i i'm gonna posit something to you i wonder what you would think about this go ahead do you think to some extent and if you think about the birth of this with andrew carnegie okay yeah. being and for those who don't know you know unlike you know jp morgan andrew carnegie came from nothing uh, yeah, yeah, he sure. came, you know, absolutely came from nothing, built, becomes, you know, the wealthiest man in the world for a period of time, and then gives it kind of all the way through, through a trust. Where, to what extent does philanthropy, has philanthropy right. taken up the, the, the mantle of this, where, and also philanthropy and the giving pledge by Bill Gates and all this, yeah. where you have a lot of these people who are, and I wonder if you did an analysis of the people that have signed the giving pledge, what percentage of those people are self-made versus hereditary Mary. billionaires yeah um and where that's been now where that's the glory that's the the you know that's that's their reinvestment mm. back in, into the civilization is through the channel of philanthropy yeah so that that's interesting actually uh so so i mentioned earlier that like so every every elite basically tries to reproduce itself um once they, they try to gain legitimacy right after they've you know become assholes and taken over the the the, the, the whole right. thing they try to legitimize their power by reproducing themselves to institutions. And so that, that's where usually, that's why they would go into, into statesmanship, right? But, right? but like you mentioned, the Carnegies did it through philanthropy. They would have these like big endowments and institutions just to like give their money out. But I think when you, th when you look at it though, it's, it's a kind of like passive, it's a very passive way to do this stuff because, okay, totally. you're going to sign the giving pledge. You're going to give away 99% of your wealth to... I don't know what, like fucking the Red Cross and BLM. So they do what? They're going to do what with it? They don't yeah. have the, the kind of like institutional capacity to do anything particularly interesting with that money um, that, 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 which I think uh, basically limits the impact of that philanthropy. So I, right. I would say that, that, that the philanthropy thing is just another way to advocate responsibility because it's, it's, it's a way for you to just pass on the 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 ability to make these involved decisions in bettering society to somebody else perfect i'm going to use this as a, a segue into something else um and we can okay. tie it all together it's fine so because what i'm what i'm hearing from this is the difference between um you know giving your money to all these foundations and or, as opposed to you who's actually the capital allocator par exactly. excellence right yeah um is that you have sovereignty and exactly. what you're doing is you are diffusing sovereignty amongst all these organizations. So I want to tie this in. Can you, and feel free to wrap it all up, or if you want, you could just move it on. But so sure. can we talk about um, how Machiavellian sovereignty can be used to measure how effective a given government uh, or institution company was, was at, at handling COVID-19 or um, uh, helping with the effort of handling uh, COVID-19? Uh, what does that say about the future of governance more broadly? Uh, by, by Machiavellian sovereignty, you're talking about the whole Burnham concept of like... Uh, Correct. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So so just for people who don't know, um, James Burnham had, wrote this book called The Machiavellians, uh, where you know he looked at um, these three science of political philosophy, uh, Mosca, uh, Pareto, and Gentile is the other one, I believe. Yeah. And, and the idea was basically that, um, you know, there's like basically sovereignty, power is the, the first and last word of political philosophy. And that um, sovereignty is, it's kind of like energy. You cannot create it or destroy it. It's always there within a system, right? And so if sovereignty is conserved, you could, you could say to, it, to an extent that that institution is a powerful and effective institution because they can accomplish what they need to accomplish because they have the sovereignty to do it. If it's more like, uh, you know, diluted and diffused, you, you can actually see that, you know, 
there's there's a way in which you can decentralize sovereignty where like the sovereign deliberately delegates sovereignty to other like capable and powerful and like very competent actors but if it's just like leaking essentially you have a problem here where, where you have a, a gap in, in, in the system and so when I, when I think about um, the American I mean look at Trump right now right Trump the whole the whole thing happening with him and, and the Supreme Supreme Court where you know he's been his, his whole like suit has been struck down right he's he has almost almost no power at all to do anything he's defanged yeah exactly and, and you think about this whole we have we had four years of of the democrats telling us that he's this fascist authoritarian oh asshole, gosh, yeah right but it turns out he can't do shit he can't do anything right. he has no sovereignty he has no power like everybody below underneath him can't accomplish anything uh, he can't order anybody to do anything that, that, that would actually um, propel his cause. And also the GOP has deserted him. He has no right. allies. So, and I say that to say that our most powerful institution is, is one of the, the least sovereign. And so now imagine, imagine where all that sovereignty has gone, right? So yeah. it's, it's gone to these agencies like the FDA, all these regu regulatory bodies. But the problem now you have all these, uh, you know, sort of like, bureaucratic institutions running off of scripts that um, have only a silver of the kind of leverage they need to be able to do uh, anything, you know, yeah. sufficiently ambitious or, uh, you know, um, effective. So right. that's, that's kind of the, the issue is uh, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an epidemic of, you know, power, responsibility, sort of like potato hopping, hot potato like throwing, I don't know. Yeah. So I, what I find interesting about that, so you, you talk about um, the regulatory bodies. Um, my guess is, is that they will be the target of whatever happens in the next five to 10 years, just because when people, particularly the FDA, right? Um, yeah. When people unpack this or multilateral organizations, right? I mean, that's obviously yeah. been very clear. The ability for highly sovereign governments like China. And I think, you know, you really make a delineation in, in your piece on this about, you know, the difference between Western Europe America, you know, the kind of Western democracies and East Asia, um, right, right. you know, where they're far more centralized and thus have a lot more sovereignty and look at the delta between how both of those, uh, you know, those two groupings of countries, for example, handled it. Um, yeah. And one of the things that people really find uh, that somebody, I don't remember who was, I was, I was reading about this, but how one of the core th um, levers of power that the United States has is regulatory harmonization with its regulatory authorities, right, right, right? right? People do not, even like the EU, or mm -hmm. even so, even very wealthy Japan, like Japan, they will look to the FDA, right, right, to set their regulatory standards. There's no agency within, um, and one of the things that I do hope occurs from this is that we really move to a multipolar world in a, as a result of this. In the sense mm. that multipolarity in regulatory, you know, bodies and the co competitive nature of those regulatory authorities, um, which would be beneficial to everyone involved, right? Yeah. Um, over time, that that's something that people realize. It's it it, uh, it it it's a humility thing on the part of the Americans and like the idea, you know, America's never been good at like saying like, wow, maybe they're doing something better, you know, somewhere else. Like maybe we should check that out. Never. But, but the <laughs> fact, yeah, right, never. But the fact that um, other countries kind of yeah. outsource, particularly Europe, I mean, the, the, the degree to which Europe is like a dead actor, it's just like unbearable. Yeah, like, yeah. Europe you know, is a museum, you, dude. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, and you look at, the, for example, like the Brexit negotiations still going on, right? And and how your how Europe looks at you know the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom has already approved the vaccine. The 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 EU will not even meet, I believe, until like the end of this month. They won't move. They can't like hop on a Zoom call like their regulators. They they by the time apparently they they by the time they have will have met and approved the vaccine, everyone in the United Kingdom above seventy five will have been vaccinated. Wow wow. You, you know what does that say? And so one of the things, and I wonder so. To form a question instead of just talking at you, um, <laughs> look again at kind of our last great moment as a country in the United States mm -hmm. was you know World War II, and FDR had amassed a, 
an enormous right. amount of power during World War II. I remember yeah. somebody published a speech that he gave and somebody said, who do you think it, it gave a speech? And everyone thought it was Donald Trump and it was FDR, you know, cause it's a very like right, authoritative right, right. speech. Um, but he was able to accomplish a, a great amount. And yeah. the diffusion of power that's been, ex you know, uh, of, you know, and which the, particularly on the right, um, you know, you've seen, um, that really hasn't served us well, I think, over time. Um, or, yeah. or, or, I mean, would you argue that, because then I, I know we'll get into things like charter cities and so on and so forth, so there's an mm. opportunity given there. I mean, is there any value? Is it worth the effort to try to reconsolidate some of this sovereignty and thus power back into these government institutions? Or mm -hmm. is it actually a, uh, you know, modernism is not coming back in this country Postmodernism is completely useless as a mm -hmm. as a as a you know as a as a philosophy or a governing framework, and so yeah. what we're really maybe moving into is whether it's Bruno's you know virtualism or some something or or, or is it uh, Balaji's you know uh, you know uh, crypto oh, states or, or state. yeah you know, network state? Um, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I, I want to make a quick. Um check against what, what we've been talking about. So, so you mentioned China, right? So China is a centralized, like you say, centralized power, centralized actor. But so the risk with, that comes with trying to reconsolidate sovereignty, the risk that most uh, statesmen and states actors make is you end up creating what China has now, which is this sort of like um, hyper authoritarian centralized government that though is effective, really you don't want because China's power is actually very insecure, right? Like the mm -hmm. moment you have to, to, to hold onto the leash too tight, that's when you actually know that you're, you're actually kind of fucked because, um, you know, Peter Zahan talks about this a lot where like, I mean, he, yeah. he makes a lot of, he's a bit too much of a geographic determinist to, to, to my, to my liking, to be quite honest. I, I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think he makes some certain good points about China's financial uh, environment where basically they use, money as as political capital not as right. economic financial capital right. yeah yeah it's a great right. point yeah and so so that's like when you attach that to their sovereignty that's an algorithm for like complete disaster because anything that can prolong and project chinese power can get capital and money so you have like a financial system built on a house of cards so at the same time once you know the gains don't accrue to to the to to the whole you know the whole population then your insecure power and your authority and your legitimacy is completely questioned right and so right. so they they have all this power yes all the sovereignty but because it's it, there's there's like they haven't struck the right balance with authoritarianism and 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 the power they have you get this insecure government and so to, to go back to your to your point um to your question was basically like should we think about repurposing that sovereignty into into American institutions, or, or yeah, just I mean, create something? Is new? there so is a is a is it a productive project of our generation, for example, right, to right. try to rebuild those institutions and re you know regain that sovereignty? Um, because yeah. I'm not saying that the, that that project would then result. My end game isn't you know a Politburo, but, right, but right. also, but perhaps you know there's just you know it's you know, it's hard, you know, the entropy is out, you're not going to kind of get it, you know, the cats yeah. out of the box. And so it's a much more productive thing. And actually, it will also, you know, be a lot more anti fragile to, to, to do that yeah. to build something new with it. Yeah, I, I'm generally not a fan of um, reform. I, I'm, I'm a fan of, uh, as you can tell by what I'm doing, like just building new things, because I think that the greatest way to actually reform an institution is to obsolete it, right, to create mm -hmm. something that to create something that actually makes it uh, it looks so outdated and like to seduce seduce you know people with greatness basically yeah you know I mean? yeah and and i think any task uh because because what would you do if you tried to reform like i don't know the fda i mean where do you start with that you know what i mean like without right. getting on a on a project of like 25 years by the time you, right. you actually reform that one institution you know the game is is, is already done and so the best thing to do, I think, so, so you know, Balaji has this whole idea of the network state, right? Um, which is, is a far more utopian version of what is actually needed. I think that you can't, you can't really start with that. I think the network state is basically an infrastructure play, but fundamentally you have to, you have to begin with, I think what Ahmed talked about, which is kind of like creating this network of builders already, right? People right. who 
we've already sniffed out the danger and have an idea of how to coordinate and um, and sort of start to construct something outside of the of the confines of what already exists. And mm -hmm. so once they start to work, you kind of have this effect where, you know, they, they, they're, they're forced to make a choice. Either we continue mm -hmm. with what we have now, or hey, mm -hmm. look over there, you have this fucker, you know, hey, let's look, let's look at Elon Musk, right? He, he built SpaceX, though he, used, he did use NASA, right? But like, you don't think NASA wanted to work with, with Elon because he was doing what he was doing? You know what right. I mean? Yeah, he yeah. was doing, they were like, this guy's doing our job. Hey, let's give him all this money so he can do it better. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So uh, that's I, sort of how and, I, and, I, and also that from the, because it's then there's a demand for that new institution, the legitimacy is much, the, the transfer of exactly. legitimacy. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's also, I mean, you can make, you can use the the parallel of, of Graham Allison's, you know, uh, like through cities trap and like rising and, and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, falling powers and where there was a peaceful transfer of power versus something that was far more yeah. kinetic might yeah. have something to do with like, there was a demand for American power. The, the Brit, yeah. like, yeah. you know, Churchill wanted, Right, he gives right. that big speech where the new world comes to the rescue of the old. He very much wanted that, right? Um, yeah. Okay, cool. I'm going to, I think we've closed out that segment. I'm, I'm gonna move on. That was, I loved it though. Okay. Okay, Alpha, tell me, what has Athens, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? <laughs> who, uh, who was uh, Tertullian, which was fascinating for me. And what is a Tertullian moment? And I would just tell you, I've actually, I lived in Jerusalem for a period of time. And, and oh, so awesome. I, I very much uh, enjoyed, you know, reading this, this little, this piece it was, it was fantastic. But please tell us, tell us about those three questions. Oh man, we're going down the, the neurotic rabbit hole here. Um, yeah. So yeah, I guess to give some context. So like I wrote this essay called the Tertullian moment. I think it was earlier last year, or is it this year? I forgot. April, April. Gotcha. Yeah, and so what I was basically trying to figure out, so I, I came across this this quote. I don't even know what I was reading, but like this quote by, by Tertullian, who was like, what has what has Jerusalem to do with Athens? There's some, some, some mm -hmm. fancy question like that. And I was like, what the fuck is he trying to say here? And basically the question he was asking is, now that theology is taking the place of philosophy, what does the seat of God, Jerusalem, have to do with the previous seat of like, you know, human evolution and progress, which was Athens. And, and I wanted to recontextualize this question because when you think about our, our world, right, you have this, this, you have this, this feeling that there is a massive amount of technological like a development at the same time, while that development is extremely irresponsible and, um, at the same time, also, not even as, as advanced as it could be. This is the whole Peter Thiel argument, right? The whole right. the great stagnation thing. I would say to Thiel that like the stagnation is a result of this question because the question asks, what, what, what is, what is the, the seat of God to, you know, the seat of technology, which if you contextualize technology as a new kind of God is I think worth asking because, um, so there's, there's a stack of, of things you have to talk about when you talk about this. So Kevin Kelly has this idea of the technium and yeah. the technium is basically the system of technology. It's basically all we have, our supply chains, our computers, the nodes, the networks, everything that's plugged into it to, to produce the technological industrial environment that we have in which we live, right? And his idea is the technium has a will of its own. It's, right. it's completely like self-generated. A lot of almost most of the technology that exists today is not, does not exist in the service of people. It's for the service right. of other machines, right? Like we have like oh, trucks carrying freight. You have like, you know, machines building other machines, right? Most of that stuff right. we don't see, we don't touch. Um, and so Kelly argues that basically we have this, this new, new powerful force of human civilization that has almost the effect of being a, our new deity because we cannot do anything without it. We pray to it, right? When, when we have like a, a, a Wi-Fi connection, we're like, fuck, we can't do anything. We go <laughs> yeah, to Google yeah, yeah. and we, 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 ask, we ask Google our most intimate questions, you know? Um, and so it's, it's, it's taken this a new- A new confession perhaps. Exactly. It's taken this new, this new religious element in our lives. And so given that I was asking how do, how do the producers of technology um, think about what they're doing, right? Because 
because now that you have a cast of people who have this power, this new priesthood, um, what is the philosophy that powers what they're creating, right? And, yes. and so, and so the Tertullian moment is the question of, um, can we have God without technology and can we have technology without God? And what actually is the power, what actually are we doing about regulating our own power um, um, if we don't have the wisdom to actually even, even wield it? So, so that's what I was trying to, to get at there. Um, awesome. I, so yeah. I, I'm going to unpack this a few, a, a few things. First of all, yeah, uh, Tertullian himself is a very interesting character. Can you just give yeah. them a, I had never heard of Tertullian before. Um, and what a robust and deep thinker he seems to have been. Um, can you tell me a little bit about, uh, tell everyone a little bit about who he was just very quickly? Yeah, he was just the, this, this Roman Carthage, uh, this Roman African who, who basically like, uh, you know, created, I guess, founded Western, Western theology because uh, of, his, of his whole, you know, you know, he centralized basically Jerusalem as this new, uh, this new kingdom of God basically on earth. Uh, that was his, his, his contribution to, to, the whole, um, to, to the whole history of Christianity. Right, which is fascinating. I mean, he's uh, that's a, he's a fantastic, uh, you know, interesting character. I mean, it's amazing that uh, he's not kind of spoken about more. I wonder if, like, in Yale yeah. Divinity School, like, if he's focused on or or not. Um, right, right. Okay, so okay, so a few things. One, I, I think this is very interesting in the context of um, I'm, I'm trying to remember his name, but uh, do you read Palladium at all? I read some of their stuff. Yeah, no, I'm, I don't. I don't have so like. I'm not subscribed. There to was a, a piece by uh, Charlie Barrowman Smith. Oh, I read um, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You read it, yeah. So on this concept of posthumanism, uh, and for those who kind of uh, don't know, if you think about humanism as the uh, set of beliefs which centralizes the human and basically says that human agency has dominates over Europe, uh, over 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 nature, you can yeah. think of the Anthropocene being a, a kind of a manifestation of that belief system. And that in the current moment with COVID-19 and a whole variety of different things, climate change, so on, you know, that our, our, our confidence in this belief system is being shuttered. Yeah. And yeah. you talk about, um, you talk about like machines making other machines. I also like think about a lot of the things of like feedback loops of like, when I think about the, the, the like a new career that exists today is content creator. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I always ask the question to people when I, when I, when I think about this is, is who is, Who's making that decision to create that content, right? Right. The, the, there is a monetization feature, right? Yeah. Uh, that is yeah. incentivizing these people to go and do these cool things. Now it's great. And it's interesting because you can be on, if, if I had to choose where to be on like the organism of the technium, I'd love to be a content creator, you know, in Bali, you know, doing cool things as opposed yeah. to maybe making, you know, tutorial videos of, or, or ASMR videos, you know, or, right. you know, like there's, like there's almost right. like a hierarchy of human, uh, 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 like a, like a Maslowian, you know, hierarchy of, of content creators, I think, but, um, for sure, <laughs> you know, who's making that decision and, 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 and Charlie uh, Burrow Smith talks about, you know, we really need to rethink about our, our, our relationship to the, to the world because, you know, and, and people have been interviewed like from Google and other large tech platforms are basically saying like, you know, it's like, it's not really like anyone's making decisions. Like yeah, things yeah. just it's become algorithms. available. It's algorithms yeah. and like people, but also like, the possibilities just arise right and so like and then they seize those opportunities and they kind of flesh out that you know that decision space or that search space and yeah. it's very emergent right you have complex you have a very you have a highly complex network civilization and technologies and now things are emerging i mean gpt3 for example right um granted that there was a decision to do that but like what the, what comes downstream from gpt3 is an entirely yeah. emergent phenomenon yeah and yeah. you know so when I think about Tertullian and, and that, that decision, and, you know, if you, if we had the, you know, if we could talk to, uh, you know, Turing or um, von Neumann, they would have a very mm -hmm. humanist view of things. Actually, no, not von Neumann because of his cyber. No, oh, oh no, I'm thinking yeah. of, uh, no, I'm thinking of what's his name who created cybernetics. Um, but, but he was a oh, huge yeah. outlier. I mean, he was a huge outlier. I think they had a very modernist humanist view of technology. Like, we are yes. building technology for humans to do X. And, and, and so if, right. if, if, if I think of them as Athens and I think of Jack Dorsey hmm. as, as uh, you know, as Jerusalem, that, like that's how I begin to view, to view things. I think Musk, Musk is a, is a very Athenian figure. Um, we think so. 
uh, maybe you could feel free to disagree. But anyway, right. I've said a bunch. What do you what do you think about some of that stuff? And and by the way, I would yeah. like to know what your answer is to this Tertullian moment um, as well. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So so you have basically technology. So the, there's this concept in design called affordance, right? It, which is basically that the way you design a an object, um, you know, invites the action, right? So for example, you have you know you have a door that has a sign push on it. So, you, you know, you know how to interact with it, right? So affordance mm -hmm. basically sets the rules for how you use a thing, right? And so you can think about technology as, you know, a, 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 a network of affordances, basically. So we have all mm -hmm. these technologies that we build um, that effectively dictate how we use them and also in, in the process dictate how we become because of that. And so Marshall mm -hmm. McLuhan has this whole quote about like, you know, we shape our tools, our tools shape us. This, this is a whole idea of basically technological affordances. And so I bring this up to, to talk to your humanist point where um, when, when you're building technology with the idea that we're here to dominate nature, which I think Bowman was, was touching to, where like the whole yeah. modernist project is this idea of man dominating nature, right? Mm -hmm. Then you, you have to design technology in such a way that you are also dominating man because that's sort of the, that's sort of the, the logical conclusion, right? Where we are mm. a part of nature as, as a fact of, as a result of being within it, we cannot live without it. And so, so all these systems end up becoming things that, um, that, that oppress and like they help us. Yes, we, we can do some <laughs> things, but fundamentally they, they, they shift the way we feel about ourselves. Like, and the way that we can actually interact with our environment. So like, let's take, for example, something simple, like the iPhone, for example. Mm -hmm. What is the iPhone? It's like, it's a black box, you know, it's, it's just a black black hole. It's a square black hole, right, <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. The whole affordance is what? It's just this, it's just that, that's the affordance. So you can just look at it, fall into it. You can't really modify it. You can't leverage it to do something ambitious or anything like that. It's just this thing that's meant to consume your attention. You know, and so, and so that's 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 the key here, where um, the, the the technology created is downstream from what we think humans are for. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, mm -hmm. that that's the key concept. Like, there's no there's no designing technology without a conception of human nature. And and I I question whether Elon is Athenian because Elon really firmly believes in this idea of, of technological of like technology for the sake of it right uh i think i, I think mm -hmm. I'm, I'm 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 like it's a conjecture i'll give you rope that's fine yeah go ahead yeah because it's like you know we're, we're building these 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 spaceships these rockets to go to to mars um great yeah that's obviously ambitious powerful vision etc but fundamentally what's the human story there you know I don't think he's ever really touched on that. Like there's no, there's no deeper ontological, you know, question like thread being pulled here. It's just mm -hmm. because we can, let's do it. Uh, which which mm -hmm. I think is, is you can encapsulate basically the modernist view of technology. That's it's just because we right. can let's do it, you know, Hey, right. we can, we can modify our genes. Let's do it. You know, yeah. <laughs> like ignoring the fact that maybe in 200 years, everyone, uh, you know, species inbreeding has happened because everyone wants to be tall beautiful and like muscular without having to work for it you know i mean that's right. what's going to happen like who, who's going to sure. decide to be you know five foot three and you know uh, 60 pounds nobody Sh sure sure yeah <laughs> right so so um so my my answer to the question so the question basically is is saying is asking what is religion and theology and all that philosophical um you know sort of like philosophical substrate to a a civilization of people who can make of themselves gods right that's really the, the mm. question and so right. my answer is we need to find a we need to find a suitable answer <laughs> that's that's my answer <laughs> okay so so uh, first of all on, on the Musk question i would actually say that he's kind of janusian in this area okay. uh, having thought about it i think spacex and tesla are very modernist i'll call them athenian projects okay, okay? i think Neuralink is right, a right, very, right. very Jerusalem, very post-humanist, you know, uh, like he says that basically like, this is how we survive, we merge with them. But the truth yeah. is right, that is a 
that's a singularity. Who yeah. Know, who, could, who could possibly fucking know what happens as a result of that, right? It's There's just- so many it's a, presuppositions in that, in that sentence, like, yeah. It, 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 it's right, and so, so I think for him, um, and, and it's not surprising given like, the, like his impact, you know, that he can kind of have multiple, you know, frameworks and, and multiple viewpoints at the same time, just because he's also spread across so many different things. Um, I want to suggest two technologies that I think could be on the horizon that maybe are much more, um, much more, uh, more like Jerusalem versus versus Athena, uh, uh, Athens, and then thinking about it in terms of you know us moving to a much more post-human view of the world as a you know as a result of what we've learned through the force de majeure of, of COVID nineteen and a lot of other mm. humbling experiences of twenty twenty. So I, I talked about this in my conversation with Ahmed. Yeah. Um, and I, so I, there was a, there's a guy uh, who I, I, I know through Twitter, like everyone, uh, Josh Marin, um, really, okay. really awesome uh, guy. He's, he's, a, he is, I think he's in DC right now. He's actually created something called Tree School, uh, which I'm, okay. I'm following him do where he like, is like learning, like learning from like, you know, le learning from trees. I'm not going to do it any, any justice, but check it out. And he also uh, emerges, he introduced tree. me to this uh, awesome uh, publication called Emergence Magazine. That's very interesting. So we were talking, we had this like brief exchange on, on, on Twitter and I, I, I was talking about it. So if you think about the iPhone yeah. as a modernist yeah, technolog sure. technological device, for sure, right? Yeah. Um, and, and particularly, and I like that you made this, you closed this loop of, it's not actually about, you know, it's effect on nature as much as it is like controlling us. I mean, yeah, exactly. it is a, and social media as it's currently constructed is very uh, like modernist and, and very, you know, uh, in that regard, but then you think about augmented reality, and the ability. And I think mm -hmm. of this in a few a few ways. First of all, what that gives you is a freedom of your hands again. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is there is a generation of people out there that don't that don't really use their hand. I mean, hands yeah. in the in the way that right. They would have to relearn how to uh, interact with the analog world. But being able to have you know information you know displayed on your environment. You know, you go outside, you're in nature, it could tell you about the things that are around you and all this stuff. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and Josh calls this AR animism. Um, mm. So this kind of, right? And so it becomes a much more, if you think about it, also just animism as a, as a, as yeah. a religious, you know, like it's super um, post, you know, post-human. It's very much the idea that like, we are not yeah. in control of this. We are like, yeah, naturalists, we are like in this as opposed to controlling it and so on. Yeah. So, uh, you know, augmented reality being a, if you think about the, I think it's the affordances that, that something like augmented reality gives you, I think that that's a very interesting thing that becomes a lot more um, po you know, post-human. The second thing, and I'm very interested in this, I, I wanted to write like a sci-fi short on this, but uh, didn't it. have the attention span, I guess. I, and I'll do it, I'll do it. But the, the idea of, you know, so with p things like GPT-3 and generative AI and yeah. Um, also, like now the introduction of like uh, objectiveless algorithms and so on. like imagine like a not too distant future where you pair unity or unreal, right? And there's mm. enough parameters kind of, you know, thought, you know, kind of constructed where you could just generate worlds and you could generate characters, you could generate scripts and storylines. And I, I think of it as like a rebirth of like the fireplace or, or the, not the fireplace, but the fire, like the campfire. Right. Where instead of being around the fire, the fire where you're and you're all like telling stories, right, around our mythology, you're like with a group of people, right? These are this is like your digital tribe, and you go into these worlds through various you know methods, and but like you're just jet like it's generating like this novelty, right? And it'll be very specific to you, right? Because whatever yeah. the world is created is going to be generated. It's not going to be the same as what the other algorithms for a different digital tribal. And then you can also have culture, like culture then, de you know, derives from that where over time, right? And it just seems like that this is, both of these things, big like AR animism and this idea of like, I don't know, like a digital generative, you know, you know, campfire, it harkens back to a much, you know, you know, yeah, you know, yeah. nomadic almost, you know, uh, your view of the world, but like a modern conception of it. Um, right. Mm. And, and, and I think the view that goes along with a lot of these things is something a lot more opened up to God or technology as a God versus technology as a tool is basically what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying. Right. AR as a way to see God, the digital, uh -huh. the digital, uh, you know, the digital, you know, fire, fire, uh, fire being kind of a way to, experience God's creations, if you will, if we, if we use a technique as an example, what do you think about all that? Sorry about the digest. Yeah, no, no, you're good. So, 
so AR to me, it seems like, so you're right in, in pointing out that we, we regain the use of our hands, but, but I also like to think about what, what we lose as well. So like, to me, the, the idea, uh, so Johnny Ive has this quote that like the, the face is a bad place on which to put the computer. Right. And, and, and I think, mm -hmm. I think there's some truth to that in the sense that um, what I'm, what I'm seeing, basically my, my field of view is, is invaded by, by this machine, right? Like I, I do have my hands back, but I'm losing something else once again. So like, whereas with a smartphone, I lost, I, I lose basically, you know, my neck, <laughs> my neck is hunched over all the time to it falling into the screen, but I lose my hands. But now with, with, with AI, with AR, sorry, I get my hands back and I, and I lose my, my 360 field of view. Um, of course, I mean, you could design these interfaces so that such that you have maximal, you know, you can solve that problem, I think it's a technology Yeah, like an problem. urbit, an urbit version of AR, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so that would be, that would be pretty cool. But, um, but I, I would say that AR, AR to me seems like a continuation of the media ecology of the smartphone. I mean, it, it's pretty much a, a kind of a, a similar way to interact with it in the sense that you have a graphical user interface just overlaid somewhere else. Uh, you know, now mm -hmm. it's an overlay in the world, but you know, it, it doesn't seem like a, a significant enough step change to me. Um, okay. So, so, but, but I don't know. I mean, obviously I could be wrong. I'm, I'm not that seeped into the, that whole space. Um, Here's I where I would just push back. Sorry, oh, go, go, ahead, oh, yeah. go ahead. No, 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 I go ahead. Go ahead. Two, two I'm trying to formulate the... One, the difference would be like, it's now, right, you do, what you do gain is you move from two dimensions to three dimensions, right? That's a huge difference because you're in three you mean dimensions. technologically. You're in four dimensions. You could even do, yeah, yeah, technology, okay. yeah, in, with technology. I mean, and also imagine, you know, um, uh, Josh Marin, I know, uh, or no, sorry, Aaron Lewis. I don't know if you know who Aaron Lewis is. He's a great, great follow on Twitter if you, if you don't, but he wrote this. Um, oh, yeah, I know him. Yeah. He, 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 yeah, he wrote this thing, Garden of Fork and Memes. And at the end, he kind of talks about this idea of introducing time into technology. So like, imagine like you create things, you know, here are your notes. Like imagine just an yeah, AR, yeah. just imagine the note function. And imagine the paper starts to yellow on the older notes where yeah, you've yeah. now introduced not just three dimensions, but four dimensions. And, and right. that becomes a much more human, much more organic. Yeah view of the world so it, i think the degrees of freedom that you're given in three dimensions and four dimensions are much greater and also from an evolutionary psychological perspective from a human perspective it's a much more human thing i think yeah because this idea and i just saw uh do you know who um what's his name uh joffrey miller is jeff miller yeah the evil yeah, yeah, guy yeah yeah, yeah 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 so he posted this picture of steve jobs with the iPhone, I think it is. And then, uh, oh no, with the, the, the Macintosh and then with the iPad. And he says, this is, the, this is what happens to the difference between what happens between humans and technology over time, right? Where the computer mm -hmm. got smaller and more sleek and you know, whatever, and then he got older. And I just, huh. bringing, bringing time and atrophy and, and, and entropy into user interfaces, th yeah, that's yeah. something that seems to be much more post-human something much more organic something much more yeah so what do you think about that yeah. that's that's why no. i think augmented reality and spatial computing yeah yeah I, th I think you definitely sold me on that on that interpretation of uh of the technology i hadn't thought about that mm -hmm. but but i think but i think um so, so just to take it back to so the, the the key limiting factor here of whether ar is a modernist or a post-human technology to me is how do we use the, the how do we gain right. the field of view right like are we sticking right. these things in our eyes because that's that's going back to the whole Neuralink thing where it's like technology as this invasive thing that basically instrumentalizes humans you know mm -hmm. where we're, we're we're just an, we're just an extension of the machine we're not even we're not even separate from it uh the whole idea of the graphical user interface was it, it was actually a kind of brain interface the whole idea was that the, the, the computer was an intermediate between you and the interface, but acting as an extension because the whole idea of the computer is that it can simulate any kind of media. So that's right. why you don't need to put that shit in, in your fucking eyes. <laughs> or, <laughs> or like in your fucking brain, sorry, not, not your eyes. And so that was the idea that, you know, Alan Kay and like, you know, Brad Victor, all this is what they're, they're, they're working towards. Um, but so, so that's, that would be the key question. If we can find a way to gain the field of view without losing that human element like are we is it just glasses you can take off on and on that could be actually great 
if it's if it's actually you have to put like things in your eyes permanently to experience this it's kind of like taking the blue pill and, sorry the red pill and like diving into the matrix you know what i mean right uh, and so i think that would be the limiting factor and in terms of the other technology you, you brought up the, the fireplace um yeah i think i think I'm, generative I'm creativity i think generative creativity yeah i'm a fan uh, of that I'm, I'm a fan of generative uh ai in the sense that 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 was the original vision of computing where you, it's not just a flat piece of glass it's a an intellectual companion that can actually help you produce new things like alan Kay is one of the biggest um into like the for the great thinkers of, of personal computing he developed the dyna book uh it was in a super early version of what you could call what what the ipad eventually became and mm -hmm. and his whole idea was that the computer was a medium that can simulate all media and so as a result it, it could help you think thoughts that you, you didn't know you could have that's the important thing because like if you think about our computers right now it's a keyboard it's a flat screen and we're we're imitating the uh, paper media paper culture right you have mm -hmm. files you have desk you have a desktop metaphor i mean that's that's office culture right yeah like, yeah we're not, we don't have we 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 don't actually have a computer futurism, right? He, he had this whole quote. He had this whole quote that the computer revolution never happened, hasn't happened yet. And, and yeah, I, I think, think I've heard. I've heard that. Yeah, and I think that's fascinating because you can sense that it's actually true. Like what we're doing with our smartphones and our computers is simulating paper culture, but also TV culture now with things like TikTok and you know YouTube and like just the, just the form factor of the smartphone. It's it's a fucking piece of glass. So. So I think, yes, generative AI actually would be a kind of post-human thing because you could, you could finally get something that could extend your mind in a way that wasn't also trying to invade and, and, and be intrusive to it. Interesting. Uh, last thing on this before we move on. One of the things that I thought about when I was thinking about the concept of a Tertullian moment or, or kind of what, it might be even just slightly downstream of it, but are you familiar with the term axial age? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for, for, for those in the audience, uh, the axial age was this period of time, this very generative period of time in the um, both philosophical and religious uh, you know, periods where you kind of had, you know, you had the Buddha, you had Socrates, or, or you had Socrates, you had, uh, you had a whole slew of religious- Homer, yeah. All uh, these Homer, people. you know, yeah, yeah, narrative figures. Um, and one of the things, and I, I don't know, call it a, it's a gut feeling, but, the, 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 a post-humanism view of things in my mind and, and, the, and an actual computer revolution where, and a view of, of, of technology in this kind of much more religious you know, lens. Right. I really feel like you, what, like there is a, a second axial age downstream of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, it is something that I find, you know, I, I think I tweeted about this recently where I was like, like it's too bad because you know, for me like my big thing is also you know um a relationship between psychedelics and a technologically advanced civilization um as well as um i'm, I'm a big uh i like lucid dreaming um and i think like lucid dreaming as as kind of like the ultimate a uh, stabilization a neuro like a stabilization of that brain state like that's the ultimate user interface i mean that is yeah. interesting uh, yeah <laughs> so like for, I, I, those are two things I thought, and I just said, well, unfortunately, I think we're gonna have to like survive the 2020s first, right? So like, like we will, we'll we to, will, but, but we will, <laughs> we will. Um, but it's just. So what do you think about that? I mean, do you do do, yeah, do does that does that? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Thank you, by the way, for bringing for focusing this because that that was actually the answer to to the Tertullian moment. It's it's basically this intuition that we need to find a way to to merge the theological with the technological. It kind of like. Technosophia, I guess you could call it, like the idea of w wise technology, um, and and I think so. The actual age was basically, you know, this 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 convergence of completely. It was the birth of of the of man, the spiritual animal, essentially, and and I think that um, you have to think about what what really made it happen. So, like, what what why exactly was that was that moment you know, the, the birth of that, of that, of that event. And basically that was like around what, I guess, 2000, 2000 BC. Yeah. 2000 to 2500 BC, something like that. Yeah. And, and what was going on around there was that we've actually, we'd actually built societies that had 
gain the kind of like agricultural surplus, right? So what what is what is what is civilization? It's basically how do you distinguish the civilization from like, I guess, you know, more, I don't want to say barbarian, but like, you know, people who don't have civilization, basically, right? Yeah. And basically technology, right? It, right? It's 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 being able to do more with less. And and around that time we'd found a way to build these albeit small but like real cities like you had babylon in Sum in sumeria you had you know athens jericho right? you had athens jericho too. yeah exactly and and so we we found a way to have agricultural surplus which meant we had um do we had to take care of communities we could feed our communities and so one once you have that that um you know downstream event how do you have how do you not create you know cohesion between those 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 communities well you need a kind of like binding you know yeah so it's funny somebody somebody tweeted this out and i was like this is i feel like i was i thought it was just excellent he was like they wrote like um yeah like food surpluses are 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 like exist for the purpose of existential angst like for the like that is what <laughs> is like that what do you get from what do you get from a food surplus existential like, exactly angst. yeah you can yeah, actually yeah. now start to think about all this other shit like yo it's raining on me what where is this water coming from <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what i mean it's, like maybe god is crying and so and so that's so uh, just to sorry you, you want to say something i guess you no no please please go ahead okay please and, and so and so and so you had this this in, this environment creating this the, this moment and so now when you think about our own our own place in in time we have also a new kind of surplus. It's not agricultural, it's industrial. We have, we've created the, the society where it's like, we have all this machinery that upholds a, a very material standard of life, but we've lost all the spiritual element because at, at least when you think about the Western context, like the West basically evolved its technological dominance um, at, the, at the cost of its, uh, spiritual and religious, uh, you know, cohesion, basically, mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? And so, so because we've lost that, now there's, there's a kind of opportunity to go beyond it because you have to think about it, right? Why, why are a lot of young people just atheists and like going, turning to um, astrology or fucking Wicca or witchcraft? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what's going on here? And basically the Tertullian question is why is Christianity or theology in general not equipped to deal with this new God technology. And mm. so to, to answer that question, you, you can't just go back, you know, you can't just return to, right. to these, you know, these old things. You have, to, you have to wonder maybe if a fusion is possible, what kind of a new Christianity or a new Islam would fuse well with this new kind of technology? At least that's, how, yeah. that's what I think is the, the opportunity for this new axial age that you're talking about. Love it. All right, let's let's shift uh, again. Um, love that. Um, so, talk to me uh, about the what it, what you term as the second market revolution. What countries or civilizations mm. do you expect to play a role in this? Right, right. So uh, I haven't read my own essays in a minute, so I have to, to go. Back I'm to sorry. This. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go ahead. They're so, top uh, of mind for me. So yeah, right. So, so the sec so first of all, let's go back to the first market revolution. Mm -hmm. So basically, we're like the way we're taught in school is basically that you know, it was shit for a minute, and then we had the industrial revolution. And now we have things and cars and th and, sh and shit, I, you know, <laughs> yes. whatever. But the reality is that the industrial revolution was downstream from the market revolution, which which well, at least the American one, the American version, which uh, which happened in America around the nineteenth century, where. Um, you know, the, the first, the first, the first, I think the, the Erie Canal was, was opened up by, by technology. And so that allowed the country, basically America's huge internal economy just opened up. And so you have yeah, all for those, these corners. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Just for those who don't understand why that's important, America has more navigable waterways in its interior than the entire rest of the world combined. <laughs> yeah. That's a Peter Zihan, you know, you know that's Yeah, Peter exactly, Zihan. yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Ge good old geographical determinism. Yeah, I mean, America yeah. is a huge, is so geographically lucky. And so the Erie Canal and, and the, the people who developed the ways to, to navigate it opened up the, this economy. And so you had this, this, in, this commercial industrial boom that was downstream from that because now you can make goods that could travel these networks, these, 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 these pathways. And so 
that was the first market revolution. It really was what made the U.S. the U.S. because it, it, it was the boon for its pr productive power and wealth. Uh, it kind of realized the, the Hamilton vision of like a super industrial society that could actually, you know, you know, take over the, well, lead the world, I guess. Um, yeah. and, <laughs> and so the second market revolution is something I've noticed. I was trying to contextualize, like, why is now, what, why is now the right time to build these technological companies? Like, what exactly happened? And so mm -hmm. you can think about, you can think of the, of the internet as a kind of new Erie Canal. And so that, that was the, the way I was uh, contextualizing it, where um, we've created this new, this new network that exists ahead of, you know, our real physical network. And the first phase of, uh, of this revolution, this, this new market revolution was just digitizing everything that was in the real world. So you had like Facebook digitizing social directories, you had, you, you had Google digitizing information, you had YouTube doing the same for video. And all these companies are, are markets. They're, they're opening up markets to knowledge, to social, to information, to video. Right. And so that's really what happened over, over the last 20 years is like we, we had this, this birth of this, this new market revolution. But the caveat that I put to this is that you have to, to remember the first market revolution had also its own industrial revolution. So they were still making mm -hmm. shit, right? There were still valuable, right. tangible goods being produced. Um, Ours is purely virtual, and I think mm -hmm. I think that's also why it explains uh, Peter Thiel's notion that we've had this, you know, forty-year stagnation. Because yes, we've had all this progress in the world of bits because of the internet and the markets, the market revolution we've had on on that network. But we've neglected the physical aspect of things, and so my my bet, you know, if I were if I were a VC, that that's sort of like how we structure my my fund. It would be like. My bet is that the second market revolution hasn't happened yet uh, fully and that we still have to build out now that we've built all these markets um, virtually. And by the way, crypto is super important here because you actually can, can even increase these, these markets exponentially, right? Now that we've built that market layer, the industrial physical layer needs also to be built to, to realize the revolution completely. And that's like building out in the real world, like cities, like, railways like new modes of transportation i mean what elon's doing is 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 super important just for like right. you know traveling between countries and shit and so so yeah i think that that's pretty much what i was trying to get get out there uh essentially super interesting you know so one of the things one thing that i think people discount though and and, and I, I i actually do buy into you know for the most part um tyler cowan and and, and, and teal's you know great stagnation um yeah when I did their like thought experiment, I think, I don't know if it was P when, when uh, Peter Thiel was on Eric Weinstein or when Tyre Cowan, Cowan was on Weinstein, but they did the thought experiment of like, think about your apartment, remove all your screens, like what's different. And I could only think of my Nespresso machine. And while I love coffee, not that big of a difference. You know, between, this is by the way, the Delta between 1971, I think, and, uh, and, and 2020. Um, but logistics technology or, or the logistics, the real like, like actual logistics layer. I mean, there are two things. So not only could one argue that logistics, I mean, the quality of life maintained during this pandemic yeah, for a lot of people, for a very yeah. large amount of people, it's very yeah. impressive. Um, yeah. And it's like Jeff Bezos got really rich and everyone's like all pissed at him. It's like, you should like, that is, yeah. he did that. <laughs> like, um, and same with like DHL and a whole that. bunch of other companies. Right. Right. Um, but then the, the, the second thing is, is a lot of people have thought about, you know, shit, we printed all of this money. And, uh, you know, this was even before, before now, but like also 2007, 2008, like get ready for the inflation and, and techno, like the deflationary, like people talk about, I mean, there is, I think some de deflation from software, like totally, but yeah. the, the deflation from, from logistics yeah, is yeah. I think very, like a, a very non-trivial like thing. Yeah. And when people think about, um, you know, when people think about just like from a monetary, you know, theory perspective, like the power of logistics, like that had real, real, and the velocity of money, all these different things that like kind of are downstream of that. Um, I just think that that just gets, people breathe over that. And I, yeah. it's kind of like, you know, I get it. It's, it's behind the consumption layer. Right. And it's, so it's like yeah, people. Yeah. It's the technium. We don't see it. Yeah. Right. You know, cool. Like I got my book, like the book has been, like my book has been here since the, you know, or, you know, we've had books in 1971, 
but my book also was delivered like to me and it was delivered to me in like one day and you know oh, so like yeah. that that component of it you know that that, that always triggers for me my, i have this rant i like i mean i don't like to do but i have this like you know sort of heretical position where i don't believe there's no such thing as free markets because of the same the same reason like because mm -hmm. basically what what's the free market it's like it's this log logistical um it's 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 the consumption layer of like the logistical apparatus of the US Navy. You know what I mean? Right. And so like if you if you take that out, if you take that out, there is no fucking such thing as 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 a free market. And, and that's the thing totally. that like a lot of libertarians and you know, uh, sort of like the the Tali Cowan types actually always great get on my nerves because of this thing because like it's like the infrastructure necessary for civilization like force is almost like step number 1. You know what I mean, mm -hmm. and and I think that um, uh, so so when you talk about, <clears throat> for example, the whole nineteenth and nineteenth and eighteenth century was Britain trying to get spice, trying to get to open up China to trade spices, yeah. right? So yeah. so they 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 had a free market after they opened up forcefully China and other other markets like India and shit like that. And so I don't want to get into all that, but 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 I think yeah, your point about this logistical layer always getting unnoticed is is actually is super, super important and and the, the second market revolution to go back to that is yes, an argument it, for for fleshing that out for repurposing it for re renovating um the the logistical layer to to enable more more wealth for more people because right now the people benefiting most from the second market revolution it's it's the bits founders it's like you know zuckerberg and page and and all those guys like only Elon really in Bezos. Are, yeah, I was gonna are, say Bezos for sure. Are in are in the world of, of matter. I mean, I guess you could say Apple, but you know, I guess it's gadgets, so I guess that, that counts too. But like it's not a coincidence that these guys are so fucking wealthy. The amount of wealthy they unlock for society because they dabble into into these this physical layer is 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 just like impressive on its own. It's legitimizing and, on its own. Yeah. And don't you think we really now you have Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are the number one and number two wealthiest people in the world, and I wonder if that does represent you know Tyler Cowen. And a lot of these people have come and said that they think that maybe 2020 was kind of the year where that great stagnation ended, and I wonder if just mm. that pure two data points were indicative. Ooh, I don't think you agree with that, maybe. But um, no, I was thinking about it. Sorry, go I mean, ahead. I mean, I'm listening. Think, think about this. So, am I like I think you know people have done this. So, like mRNA vaccines that's a hard tech you mm. know solution um downstream of this is is, is you know alpha fold so like uh, you know uh, or gpt3 yeah. um so so some of these are still in the areas of bits but um you know uh i think the first uh, the first hyperloop was 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 uh you know put forth there's been some battery technology yeah. there's some battery technology breakthroughs um and, and so on but so there, there, the people point to some of these things as being kind of indicative of a, a, a move from away from stagnation, right? So, so I guess, or at least the, the beginning. Thing, I mean, just the beginning. Okay, yeah, yeah. The, the thing is, green beginning, shoots, right? green shoots. Green okay. shoots. <laughs> I, I can agree with that actually, but but I would caution that maybe one year is a bit too small of a data point. I think we need to go like we need to we need to have a streak, right? Because for 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 what the fifties, you had atomic bomb, internet uh like fucking washer and dryer machines you had like it was success you had the car getting you know, Appli you appliances better. in general i mean all your appliances yeah that was like a, a successive you know and, you, and then you had of course you know the, the, the airplane travel and all that stuff so like right. it was back to back to back so i think yeah i think this year is a good start definitely uh let, let's see how the next five years play out, see how plans out. okay cool let's tie into because i asked and i, I want to tie it into I'm going to say some, so tie it into your idea of the African moment, and then we'll go in, in through that, mm. you know, to Hinto. Um, one of the things that I find very strange, and I've, I've had the privilege, I lived in, in, in South Korea for a period of time. I, I, I've been, I work for a Singaporean company. Um, so I, I get, you know, East Asia. And one thing that people just fundamentally don't seem to understand is like what a demographic time bomb East Asia is. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. East Asia is going to be one of the oldest, if not, it will be the oldest continent or, or kind of a collection of countries by like 2030. Um, you oh, know, wow. if you, if you, later. No, yeah. 
it could be a little later, 2035, whatever. Um, and, and, yeah. and some countries get ro- roped into that that are, are younger than, um, True. You know, very young. And so they bring down, but I mean, South Korea, Singapore, Japan, those Japan, countries are yeah. very old. Uh, China's already from a working age perspective, older than the United States, uh, you know? And so people look at, and there's so much focus on Asia as yeah. the, the continent of the future. Why don't you tell people a little bit about, you know, the African moment, why that's wrong. Um, mm-hmm. And maybe just tie yeah. in together why that then, why then, you know, the second market re- revolution can really be harnessed on the African continent and, and we'll kind of, right, right, right. we'll use that to push our way through to, 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 to Munto. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. So um, when you think about, so I have this, this other heretical uh, thought that, that basically China is the new Japan in the nineties, you know, I, yeah. I think, I think, I think people are, we should be wary about, of course, they have real power, they have real capacity. Sure. Um, but I think that China can be handled just like Japan was in the 90s. Uh, I think they're, they're having a moment right now. But for me, I, I, I see China as basically just another high modernist, you know, Western state. I mean, like the, the running off of the script that was that's ontologically Western, it, it, there's nothing really Chinese about the CCP. No, you know? Chinese, no Chinese characteristics. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so where's the Confucianism? I mean, where? Yeah, I they mean, just okay, talk about, they, you can say Confucian and you can say the word harmony, but that doesn't make it true. Exactly. And so I bring this up because to me that, that tees up um, the, the continent and the people that people love to ignore uh, Africa. So, so just, just to give your audience, if they don't know about it, the Please. demographic data. So. Um, and this is pretty reliable data. It's like the UN and, and other other yeah. institutions like that. So, like by 2100, it's projected that about one in three people in the world will be African. So let me say that again. But by 2100, <laughs> one in three people will be African. So that means one out of three people you see walking around the street will be will be African. And 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 what that means, of course, is so Henri Lefebvre is this French writer who has this quote that like demography is, is destiny. And I think that it, that's a bit too deterministic, but, but when, when you understand the rise of America in a demographic context in the 19th century, and also China now, which is you know, leveraging that over the last 50 years actually to, to get to where they did until they started the whole one, one child policy thing. Um, when you understand those, th- those, those shifts, like you start to realize that what's gonna happen on the African continent is either going to be one of the greatest like economic growth stories of the 21st century, or like a huge humanitarian catastrophe, because right. because by 2050 you have about one billion people on the continent just working age, right? So that, that's a bunch of young men and women about 20 to 25 entering the workforce. Okay, so let, let's play this out, right? Let's say they don't have, let's say they don't have enough jobs, enough institutions, like the banking infrastructure to build a life. What are they going to do? Yeah. They're going to get the fuck out. They're, they're going to get on those ships, get to Europe, get to the West, maybe even China, right? Some of them are already doing that. And, and what that's going to create is like a kind of ge- like geopolitical shift that you, you can imagine Syria times like 200 or like 1,000. It's going to be- Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, we can't even imagine. And so, so the, the whole idea of the demographic growth that's happening on the continent is, which- which, by the way, is you can't you can't stop it. Like the five billion is assuming a a the gro- the a reduction in <laughs> in, in like yeah. So the whole idea behind that is it's either like it's a Dickensian position. Either it's the best of times or the worst of times. And so you have to think about how exactly do you leverage that to turn into something productive. And so mm-hmm. China is interesting because. Because they, they, they know this already, actually. So they know that by, by, by 2100, they'll be half their population, right? Right. Even if you start, you know, a whole new, like, let, five child policy, you know, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, no, right. Uh, I mean, there's also, of, right, people should also note that the, also the problem is, is that the people in, in the fertility band in China, there's an enormous right. mismatch of women to men uh, exactly in favor right. of men. In favor of men, yeah, exactly. Cannot, yeah. yeah, so it's, that's, what's also, <laughs> that's also what's very terminal about it. Go ahead. Exactly. And so as in China, China also has, has become a, a, a post-industrial society, not, not in the sense that they stop making stuff, but to, to be able to, to make it productively, they need to go to other markets. They need to sell it to, to other markets. And so 
uh, they see Africa, the Africa's demographic growth as a, a, both a market opportunity and a supply opportunity. You can get both the supply for like low skill labor manufacturing. And once, once you have like, you leverage the growth later on, they can also buy your products as they have more, more, you know, more, more consumption dollars. And so that's why they're, they're moving so effectively in, in, in Africa, because, you know, through the Belt Road Initiative, they're building all this infrastructure um, that they can leverage. Are they though? Get, well, are they Alpha? Are they actually building it though? They're, they're, they're not, are they, are they not? They've pulled back. They've pulled they, back they, a very, it's, I mean, go ahead. I mean, I, I would just argue that I do believe like, I think they've been so shocked by some of the defaults. Like people talk about, oh, yeah. well then they'll get like assets. That's like the whole plan. I'm like, let me tell you something. Like they, China cannot afford to default, like lose dollars. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just default for assets, like, you know. Right. And so, okay, so so they're they're building the the infrastructure they need to get the kind of mineral ore they need to to further their industrialization. Let's put it that way, right? It's okay. like a lot of these like opaque deals they're doing with very selective uh, states on the continent to be able to get the kind of um, industrial and like future market gains they can get from the continent. And so, because uh, if you think about if you look at the data, right, over the last ten years, uh, investment in Africa by China has increased by ten percent uh, mm -hmm. to to forty billion. At the same time, America's investment has reduced uh, twelve percent to like fifty-seven. Uh, so America is still pu pouring more money in it, but it's like it's aid money. It's not core infrastructure Production. money. You know, China is building like roads. I mean, it's not great quality stuff. I should I should point that out as well. They're not building great quality infrastructure. They're just doing the bare minimum to be able to get the kinds of deals they need from those countries. Um, Have you seen what Japan is doing in Africa? No, actually, I, I'm not. Japan I'm not. has 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 uh, has now begun to become. You know, Japan. I mean, anyone who's been to Japan. I mean, you don't even need to go to Japan to know how great their infrastructure <laughs> is. I mean, these people know how to build infrastructure. They do, um, yeah. They've begun to also. I think a lot also just because right, they have such a terminal demography as well, and they're also rich enough where they can take the their you know, profit um, and reinvest it into uh, you know markets with growth, which they yeah. won't have. Um, and they've been doing that. They've begun to do that in the form of infrastructure investments in Africa. I, I just wanted to add. Interesting. So, and, and, and if you think about the Quad Alliance, uh, you know, from a geopolitical perspective, which is for those who don't know, Japan, United States, Australia, and India being aligned, uh, you know, in a in a maritime alliance against China. Um, yeah. So, I one of the core strengths of the United States is its alliance network. So it's not just about their fifty-seven billion. It's whatever ch you know, Japan. Sure you know, and, and, and yeah. Australia brings the cake. For the sure. Equation. I just wanted to bring Yeah, and for sure. And by the way, America still has like a shit ton of bases on the continent, right? So, right. so they're, right. they're not they're not going anywhere else. And so, um, but I bring this all to, to say that basically the demographic contraction is also not just related to East Asia. It's also present in the West. I, I'm sure you know about right. this. Yeah. Europe, Europe Germany, more than, Germany. than America though. America is going to be- Correct. America is always going to be fun, I think, honestly. It's uh, I mean, people, just people the underestimate- immigrant, yeah. Yeah, the the immigrant you know function and also the fact that it's just so fucking big and powerful. Like the redeeming factor of America is always going to be that it has a global hegemonic monopoly on violence. I mean, no one else in the star system can say this. You know what I mean? Right. So it's like yeah. as long as this remains, uh, they'll, they'll be fine. And also the problem the problem though, of course, with that is that's downstream from the technological development. And right. that's also a downstream from culture. So if you don't solve the cultural problem, you can't really maintain that. But that's another, that's another question. Anyway, to go back to Africa, right? So um, yeah, so so Africa is this kind of like new theater, geopolitical theater of the century because um, you just cannot ignore it. I mean, you can, but it's going to bite you at your peril. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and so and so to to take this to to Junto, basically. To actually take bring us back to everything we've been talking about, right? Sure. Um, I think that the, the phenomenon of charter cities is is a kind of like new state technology that allows uh, that allows the opportunity to to create to have a full stack approach to solving all these these problems at once, right? Like industrial policy, um, governance, urbanization, uh, you know, and just culture as well, and so. Just to, 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 to give a brief like description to your audience, charter cities are new cities given special jurisdiction yeah. to bootstrap a new kind of governance system by a sovereign state, right? 
and and there are no real like out and out charter cities in the world right now. It's a pretty new thing, but uh, so I'm working on this company called Junto, and the idea behind Junto is basically to create a network of these charter cities in Africa to leverage the demographic and urbanization growth and turn into something positive for the continent, the whole world, et cetera. And, and uh, that's gonna take a, a kind of like, like I said, a full stack approach to, to, to solving all these key points um, that, that we've been talking about, like the, leveraging the second market revolution to build core logistical infrastructure to improve industrialization, you know, having the right ontological philosophical perspective to build the right kind of technology to sustain civilization. What kind of governance um, do you need to, to run these cities and empower these cities? Because we know that, you know, East Asia has problems with, with the centralized governance of China. And to be frank, I'm not a fan of what America is doing right now or, or Europe, by the way. So, so there's, a, there's a genuine opportunity to just build really cool new shit Tabula, right? tabula rasa yeah <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. clean slate like and just go and just leverage all this new tech but also crucially this these exponentials to to really create something awesome i love yeah. the idea because people have always talked about um technology and economic development um they've used the term leapfrogging in that context but i love the idea of leapfrogging in terms of statecraft and, and political yeah, institutions exactly. and so on it's a very very interesting concept yeah. Um, and one of the things that it seems like you, not that obviously with, you know, one in three people being African, um, not that they need it, but you also, I think in terms of the capital inflows that you were thinking about was by using the African, the African American diaspora or African diaspora yeah. largely, is that, exactly. is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So talk a little bit about that. And I want to post me when I, when I, when I thought about this, um, do you know who Hannibal Burris is? Of course I know. Yeah, of course. Okay. So Hannibal Burris was on a podcast, I believe it might've been Joe Rogan. Um, and he was, he said that he had just taken a, he had done his DNA and I believe okay. he found out that he was, he was Guyanese. And so that he was going to go spend like a year or time in Guyana. And, um, you know, I know that I understand this in the context of the Jewish diaspora. Um, mm, and, yeah, yeah. and how, and how like, there are people particularly who were um, after the Spanish Inquisition, like pushed out of Spain and Portugal who live in other places and yeah. don't even, and, and then all of a sudden find out that they're, that they're Jewish. Um, and then they go and they get something like a yeah. birthright or something like that. And then they go and they can make that connection. What I, what I find interesting about, you know, this in terms of the constellation of, of, of um, where you put these charter cities, if mm -hmm. you, if you mapped it on, if you, and I don't know how true this is, and I don't, I, I must, I, I must admit ignorance in this, but if you can map this in terms of like, what are, if at all, if there are in African American community, for example, um, heavily weighted towards specific countries, mm. putting the charter city within the context of at least that nation state, which they, cause then there's two poles. There's, there's, you know, the opportunity. And then there's also the cultural yeah, re, yeah. you know, reconnection, which I think is super interesting for people and, and yeah. having, and having experienced it into a certain degree myself is, is incredibly rewarding. What do you think about that? And and so, yeah, let's push it forward. Yeah, actually it's funny because the whole concept behind, so our first city is, is basically designed around leveraging the diaspora uh, as, okay. as, a, as a seed community. And, and that was informed by the Jewish diaspora actually. So I read about okay. uh, Theodore Herzl. I'm, I'm pretty sure you know who, yep. who he is. And he wrote this book called The Jewish State where he basically outlines a kind of um, just a plan, a strategy, a playbook to get uh, Jewish people dispersed around the world, their own state. And, and as you know, I mean, the result of that was some, some like 20 years later, the birth of right. Israel. And so- um, Should I be think, noted by the way, for people that he did not expect this to be in the land of Israel. He was looking at Africa. He was looking yeah, at, you know- he looked at he Africa. He was looking at other, he, didn't, he did not expect you know, uh, you know, right. get a Turkey there and get, get it in Palestine, get yeah, into, yeah, yeah. Israel, yeah. And so and he was looking at Africa, which I thought was super hilarious. Like, what if that happened like, in terms of like historical what ifs? But, yeah. but, um, but, but yeah, so like, I, I use that as, as an inspiration because so the African diaspora, you have about 140 million dispersed uh, around the world. And, wow. and yeah, and, and so, and so that is its own network of cities, right? Like my, my whole idea is if you can aggregate that demand and, and, uh, and find a way to, to, des to design cities on the continent that basically serves as infrastructure to house these people uh, on the continent, 
you, you've you've recreated a, a constellation of, of city states that, you know, you know, could 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 leverage that productive uh, population, you know, extremely extremely productively. And so you have something like a hundred billion dollars um, caught like concentrated within that group of people because uh, for, for the last time I read about 50 billion of economic values produced by the diaspora in, in the West and 50 mm -hmm. more billion return to the continent in terms of remittance, um, which mm -hmm. constitutes like something so, like 17% of GDP on the continent. In the diaspora numbers, that's not, that does not count African-Americans within its, it does, it within does, its it rank. Does count them. It does. Yeah. yeah. It, so, it does discount them. It does count them. It does count them. It does count them. Yeah. I can't, okay. The productive, I just think those numbers seem, I mean, there's at least enough black, ex I mean, there's black excellence in the United States. If I just think about like, <laughs> in, if I just think about like what they produce and what their wealth is, I'm surprised that it, or, okay. I mean, but I, I, it's just, it's, I, would, it's, I would imagine it'd be larger. That's all. I mean, yeah, in, in numeric well, terms. Maybe, maybe it is. I'm not, I'm not sure. I guess uh, from the numbers I read, I can show you the, the studies after that, if you want to check for yourself. Sure. But, but, but yeah, so, so the idea is like, so I don't want to make it, so there, there's a whole, oh, sorry, I just, no, so there's a good. whole, there's a whole, um, there's a whole aspect of this where you're like, okay, well, especially for black Americans, right, that we're here, this is our country, we don't want to go anywhere else. And I totally understand that because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that's something that you actually have to, have to take into account, but it, that shouldn't preclude also the existence of this, you know, other, um, you know, just like a second, a second home. Like there's a bunch of Jews who remain in the you, US. You, so you should, you should, I mean, and I don't, I'm sure you have, but like reading into the way, the relationship between, for example, American Jews, British Jews, Canadian, Australian, particularly in the Anglo sphere, just because continental Europe hates Jewish people, plain and simple, really? <laughs> for the most part, right? Uh, um, like there's just such a history of it. And it's like, you know, when I was in Israel, um, last time I was living there, I think, I don't know if it was per an annum or within like three or five years, 80,000 French Jews left um, because of like increased uh, anti-Semitism and, and violence and so on. Jesus. Um, so, but the relationship, like I can speak, you know, I've lived in Israel for a long time and I, and what's also interesting when I think about this in the confines of myself, like in the context of myself, I went to Israel many times for advancement because I could get, mm. I could get there's the economic vitality of Israel and like the, especially yeah. technology and the fact there's a culture where they'll give young people a lot more um, agency and responsibility yeah. because of the, the relationship of, of the military. So I, and I use that, but then I, but I came up because America is my home. Like I love, like, yeah. you know, I can't, yeah. but I have a, this dualistic relationship and it's a complicated relationship, particularly in the confines of, uh, in, the, in the context, excuse me, I don't know why I keep using that, of, of, of anti-Semitism because it's often used, right. That, you know, you know, who who are they really you know for like you know who is that yeah you know, so yeah. it's it is you it, it could be used against them but that's it's an interesting parallel of what what maybe people in the black community in America could expect to have like as a relationship between one of these cities the you know these city yeah. states yeah no it, it, it's it's something I've, I've thought a lot about um, and I, I have a few black American friends we've talked about this and and they they generally are super excited for the project it's just that. They, they, they have a bit of caution just in general, because like, you know, by the way, I'm an immigrant. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm from Ivory Coast. Uh, although my story is a bit unique because like I'm from Ivory Coast, but I'm not Ivorian. My parents are from Guinea, so I'm Guinean, but I've never been in Guinea and I grew up mm -hmm. in the US and I lived in Senegal. I, I have no fatherland. <laughs> so, right, 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 right. And so like, um, so I'm more open to this idea of, okay, I'm gonna build my own, right? Which is pretty much what I'm doing. But, but a lot of them don't have that, that, that that lever they can pull. And so the idea eventually is not to start with necessarily people that have already built um, homes here, but like to get the more recent uh, uh, sort of like mm. uh, ex exports of the diaspora to, to come back uh, as a way to, to gain more there than they would on, the, on, the, on their home country. Mm. Right, right, right. And yeah. so how, you know, tell me I, and tell everyone like, you know, first of all, New Atlantis is the name of, of, of this first city, or is it the... It, it's, it's the tentative name. Yeah. The tentative <laughs> name, okay. And, and by the way, for everyone, you know, I'll obviously be posting, you know, in the link, you know, uh, I'll be publishing, you know, the, the, the website, the link to the white paper and so on, that, that, awesome. where you outline this. So, um, 
where do you see, uh, how is it going? I mean, is it, is it, is it are, are you seeing a lot of uh, momentum? I'd be curious. I mean, you are talking, you know, you've just said, and so I don't want to like hearken it back to it, but like, cause you said that, you, you know, where you're targeting your efforts, but in yeah. the context of like the, the, you know, in the context of the, um, you know, BLM and all these things, like if that couldn't serve as some form of a momentum thing with the, you know, actual like, you know, community here in America, but like, yeah. So what, I mean, where are you experiencing, I guess, where are you experiencing mo feeling momentum? Where are you feeling yeah. friction? Um, mm -hmm. and, and maybe like anyone who's listening or whatever, like, how can they help or if they're if they're interested in participating you know um if they're part of you know the diaspora community like all these different things sure. I mean, i'd love to like get a build it out yeah awesome good question so most of the momentum is actually from the continent so like i've spoken i've gotten in touch with a lot of young uh young nigerians young Ghanaians who uh who who have responded the most to it mostly from my network but like also from people that they've known and they shared shared it with and and it's pretty understandable like uh, one of them basically told me that, um, you know, when they read my white paper, the, the end SARS movement was like top of mind because that's, he, he thought, he basically thought that the end SARS movement would be the catalyst. I don't know if you know the end SARS movement. It's this whole- uh, I, I do. Yeah. But gotcha. you should give uh, the context for everyone, please. Yeah. So, so there was, there was a whole police brutality, uh, you know, protest movement that erupted in Nigeria as a result of, you know, police violence against citizens, I think three months ago, something like that. And yeah. he, he thought the movement was going to be a kind of catalyst for these young people to leverage that and build something new. But like he, he, he told me he was disappointed because they didn't have the infrastructure to, to actually leverage all that energy right. and turn it into something productive. And so right. um, and that's what I've been hearing. Like a lot of these young people, uh, there's, there's been like a wave of revolutions protests more like <laughs> on the continent. Like there's, there's Guinea, there's. Uh, Ghana, Uganda, not Ghana, sorry, Uganda, uh, you know, Nigeria, there's been some, some, some scuffles in, 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 I think, Ivory Coast or Senegal. And, and so you have, what's going on is pretty simple. All these young people that don't have any jobs, that don't have any prospects, that live in pretty much like um, decrepit, you know, poorly run states and what an opportunity. They're the ones who've most responded to this because they see it as just a lifeline, you know, something that they, they can actually latch onto without having to, you know, get on a ship and go to Spain or some bullshit like that. Um, uh, in terms of the BLM stuff, one of my friends is a black American who's, who's, who's read the white paper. And uh, I don't think he made the connection, but to him, he's, he's been, he's been looking into his own like ancestry. And, and mm -hmm. that, that, that's been something that uh, he's, he's, he, he wants to leverage it as like a way to, to reconnect with, with, with the continent. So I think right. I, I, want, I don't want to use like these, these negative um, points to pull people. I think there's much, I, there's I, a I, better I, story to tell anyway, right? Like, which is, yeah. you know, this whole continent we can build and this, this, this opportunity you can gain just from like building a new world, right? That, that's cool. That's, you can build a city with us. You know, we're not going to do it just top down. Like this is the whole thing we're doing together. It's our generation. I'm the same age as them. You know, it's, it's right. not any, anything else. Um, but yeah. That's the movie. How, how, um, how, uh, you know, what about the relationship with the, the, the nation state that would be, you know, right, hosting right. this? Because, you know, yeah. to, I think you have one thing playing to your advantage because in which, in, in, with the respect to what I'm about to say, and, and, and obviously just think that it would be like a core disadvantage for anyone, which is kind of a inferiority with respect to your system of governance, right? It's like, here I am, I'm going to put it here, like in this state that's like struggling to be able to function. Let me come in. Right, right. Now, I was going to say, you know, the fact that you are a member of the diaspora coming back as opposed to like, you know, uh, Milton Friedman's, you know, grandson, <laughs> which would, like, I don't mean to be a try. It's like you would run up. Th there are sociological, there are, um, you know, yeah. there are points of view that would become an enormous hindrance to that, I think, um, yeah. which I don't think you, which I don't, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think you would be, you, you, you would get as a result of just who you are. For sure, for sure. Um, but, but how do you envision that, you know, or do you, yeah. or do you actually select for something where you feel like you could have a lot more of an equal like footing with the nation state so that they don't have that sense? And yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, so the tentative strategy right now is to, to, to basically collect and capture all the diaspora demand 
and use that as leverage to, to, to field interest from governments, right? Because mm -hmm. as I said, it's a pretty economically valuable contingent cohort of people that, mm -hmm. you know, any, any state would, would, would want to have. Kind of like what's going on with the whole f movement from Silicon Valley right now to Miami, where, you know, you have the mayor of Miami just courting these people because he knows, yeah. right? you know, this is a boon, right? And so that's the, kind of the same strategy we're, we're fielding here. But um, we do have some states we want to work with specifically um, and so, for example, like I have, I have a meeting with uh, Ghana's uh, deputy finance minister sometime next month to, to talk about the project. And so, um, because Ghana has the kind of political stability that, that you need for-, for So for, there are for, prerequisites for, that you need. Yeah, yeah. It, it can't just be obviously the Congo, right? I mean, as right. much as I love the rivers, it's, it's a little too dysfunctional right now to have that kind of project there. And so right, okay. we're not coming in there and saying, hey, your, your governance sucks and we're just gonna fix it up for you. That, that's never gonna work. We, 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 right. we wanna build relationships with, the, with these, the people there and especially the, the, the young statesmen and, and stateswomen in, in the country to co collectively help progress and, and build the government, the, the continents, sorry, the country's growth and uh, political culture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I do wanna mention though that that involves also getting actually embedded culturally and politically in, in their own country. Um, and so right. that's gonna be, it's, it's, a, it's a tenure project. So that's gonna take a long time to yeah. do, but it's something that we're, we know we have to do and we're willing to do. Uh, and and that's, that's, how, that's how it's gonna work. Otherwise it's too, it's too push rather than pull in terms of demand creation. Great. And, and from an economics perspective of what, and I'm going to introduce you something, and I, I don't know if I'll get it in time to publish alongside this, but I've, I've been thinking about, which is like, in the context of just charter cities generally, from yeah. a, from like, you know, setting up the economy of these charter cities, almost every charter city that I've seen discussed, it's like, it's going to be, you know, the top, you know, 2% of digital labor producers, yeah, right, yeah. who are going to, you know, because those are the people who know that this is going on, those, are, you know, they're going to, it's like, okay, cool, like, um, one, for example, let's take New York. Yes, um, there is a culture of 11 Madison and fine dining in New York, but there's also a culture of papaya dog and like, yeah. you know, and like, you know, Bodacious, New York is, yeah. is, you know, New York, uh, New York has an advantage in, in high finance and technology, but guess what? I don't know if people really understand, like New York is actually the construction capital, like par excellence. I mean, the way that we build tall mm. buildings is faster yeah. than anything. I can explain how they use these. There's a company out of, I think it's New Jersey that, created the scaffolding that allows you to build the outside as opposed to the core first and thus allows wow. you to build you know i live in long island city and, and for, for you know you know long island city for those who don't long island city i i came here in 2012 after i graduated my folks moved here and then i i moved here after i came back from israel i mean other than asia i've never seen a, a like a piece of land just be developed like this it's like in mm, new york and i was thinking I was, yeah. like, I was like there's no way these people are like doing this to code and then i learned about this <laughs> construction technology that allows them to build these buildings so quickly yeah um, so, so anyway, my point being that you can't just have this idea that you're going to just have a, a populace of digital yeah. nomads yeah. producing digital labor who don't, it's like that hard to, you know, you can't do that. So then I, you have two, so you kind of have two models that I've, I, you know, that I, I can glean from, uh, you know, you have a, a very you know, diverse, um, and it doesn't have to be diverse, but it is diverse in the, in the case of, of Singapore. And then, but then you also have Shenzhen where you have like, cheap labor but then you also develop you know capacity internally and so on and and so mm -hmm. it just becomes like a very complex diverse economy with like you know better looser regulations that allows it to kind of build up wealth and then over time and then you have petro states right then you have du yeah. you have dubai and, and and so on where you have a commodity that's valuable and then you export that commodity so yeah. i've been thinking about this because one i mean dubai is nestled one in a nation state they also, they, they want a, ge a geographic lottery of, of having enormous natural right. resource wealth below them. And I can imagine, and I, w I wonder if you know about this, like if, you, if maybe you're in these conversations, that probably a prerequisite to wherever you get put is a surveying of the land to make sure that they're not giving you, right, like highly productive natural resource wealth. Uh, I, I mean, I, I would just imagine that, that they're like, yeah, we're not going to put you on top of a natural gas field or, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, right? So, so then it's like, okay, but then what's your commodity? What could you, because, and the reason is, is that uh, just to say that the charter, it's a petro state model is much quick. I mean, I think it's just a much quicker linear economic model versus obviously the other. Um, yeah. uh, and, and so, 
um, I thought I, I've been thinking about this, and so I, I'm going to pause this to you and curious what you think, and then I, we can you know unfold it into kind of your also your view for Junto in terms of what an economic you know um, development you know path looks like. But mm -hmm. so I also think what's great about Petro State right is that oil also gives you uh, geopolitical power. So you yeah, have to like yeah. not only do you get economic power, but you also get ge geopolitical power. So I think okay, so what are like the two commodities right? that really um, today prove existential risk like to the entire world. No charter city is gonna be allowed to develop or uh, handle uranium, right? So like that's out. The, se the second being carbon dioxide. Mm. And so I was thinking about, you know, this idea of, you know, with things like alpha fold, uh, you know, alpha fold, so this protein folding, you know, advanced that, that, you know, they talked about in their explainer video, I was thinking about this, they, they talk about creating an enzyme that you can release in the atmosphere and then it metabolizes the CO2. So imagine, let's just in a, in a thought experiment that this a charter city it develops that technology, it will release that you know that ends up in the atmosphere. It'll securitize that CO two that it is sequestered and sell it on the carbon market to governments and countries. So it's a sequester state. It is the reverse of a petro state, and it and it's it's commodity that it's exporting is the sequestered CO two, mm -hmm. um, and that be, so. I mean that that's just that's the idea. Um, what do you think about that? Just curious, like, you know, it's fun to like talk to, to ping pong that, you know, idea back and forth with people, but, um, and then, and then feel free to just talk about also how you view Junto's, uh, you know, economic development model. So, so let me, let me see if I get it straight. So you're saying that, um, a, a viable economic model is to create this kind of like sequestered state export model, basically that to, to, Correct. to supercharge an, an economy. Uh, well, I, I guess I have a few questions about it because I'm not as, as well informed about it as you are. What what sure. what exactly is the is the uh, is the market? What does the market look like for that? So there are carbon markets, right, that have been developed. So you, yeah. airlines, for example, are doing carbon art offsets and all these things. So there is a carbon offset market, carbon credit market that has been developed. Okay. Um, and so right now, in, in in a cap and trade model, right, it's basically also you're you're paying for the privilege. You can either pay for the privilege of producing carbon, or you could pay for an offset mm. of carbon. Gotcha. So this yeah, would be yeah. targeting that offset mar mar market. You would obviously have to figure out a way to meter and basically create like, um, you know, accountability in terms of the sequester state, making sure it's yeah. like, yeah, we are. Because actually there's an enormous issue in carbon off offsets of like, of are you actually offsetting real, like the real carbon? Yeah. Um, and so, so it's, but it's about securitizing it and, and basically it's like a reverse flow, right? Yeah. Like of a commodity. Um, so mm, there are that's... developed carbon credit markets for that. That that is fascinating. I'd never thought about that as as a as a, uh, as a you know, like a, a seed a seed economy. Um, I, I guess it would be viable to to experiment with if the the sort of like, first of all, the, the market upside was great enough, but also the the potential of of employing people to produce it. Like, well, what's the barrier of entry? Because like the advantage of a basic low manufacturing industrial policy is. You don't need that many skilled workers, right? You just need a huge amount of number of people to do it, which is why um, you know China has grown it the way right. it has. And, and so, for that, I'm assuming you would need a kind of like, uh, I, I, I guess, a greater level of baseline competence uh, to to operate it, right? Sure, right. So, um, I mean, this obviously in the, it, it, there's baked in trillions of assumptions around you know who these people are and what the skill set they have. Um, but yeah, you would need to have, cause you know, um, if I, I'm forgetting the company, but there's a, you know, a company, uh, a Gink, Ginkgo Bioworks in, in Boston right. where they do like, you know, where they use synthetic biology to create perfumes and, 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 and industrial products, chemicals and so on. Um, so I'd imagine it being something similar to that in terms of the manufacturing of this at scale, this enzyme. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the truth is, is that, uh, you know, it takes a lot of people to uh, be a petro state. Uh, you know, yeah, oil and yeah. gas needs re refining. It needs all these different things, and there's different types of end, end products. Um, and and certainly, I haven't done enough of the research to know like kind of what that like like the actual labor supply required, and then the skill sets associated with those people to be able to, to put it off. It's just a thought thought experiment. But uh, I thought you yeah. had fun thinking about it. <laughs> no, dude, I'm so interested. Like, can you just send me uh, what you read about over this? I'd love to look. Yeah, at so it. I, I didn't. I just I, what I read about it. I I wrote it. Oh, okay, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I I'm, I'll finish it up, um, and I'll send it over to you. I mean, it's really brief. I, it's actually. I haven't done, all I have done is conceptualize this thought experiment. All I've written is like five paragraphs, like, like, like say, like do it, like saying what I've just said to you for the most gotcha. part. Awesome. Um, in terms of, you know, 
the, you know, th like, you know, one diving into, you know, the possible spaces of enzymes, right? The search space of possible enzymes that could do this and so on, you know, haven't done that, but that would be the next step, right? Um, and then, um, yeah, I mean, but, but, yeah. but, but that is, you but, know, but please do, that, really... that sounds, that sounds fascinating. I want to, I want to get a look at that, but, but generally okay, cool. speaking, generally speaking, um, what, what we want to do, so you mentioned like all these, these projects that want to just create like, you know, these small like you know virtual like a uh, virtual nomad havens right and, everyone's and, an angel investor everyone's an ai engineer, exactly you know. and, and to me that that sounds so myopic because especially in africa and there are some projects that are trying to do that and i don't want to i don't want to rag on anybody i, I think it's, sure. it's good that they're doing anything on the continent uh, but i think that in terms of the scale of the problem and the scale of the opportunity it, it would make very little sense to 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 to, to, to start there because I don't believe in incrementalism also. That's, that's just another philosophical thing. I think you can build something ambitious just from the get-go. And so I think our, our approach is always going to be to, so first of all, the philosophical aspect. Basically, the reason why Africa, broadly and reductively speaking, hasn't uh, been wealthy is because we have not industrialized. It's as simple as that. We, we, we're, we have... I mean, 9% of the world's cobalt is in Africa. I mean, for God's sake, we have all the mineral deposit to, that should enable us to leverage it to our advantage and create uh, the kind of industrial baseline that we need to actually produce goods and, and valuable uh, productive economies. And so um, the reason it hasn't happened, obviously, at least there's, there's a lot of reasons, but in the Francophone countries, there are enough incentives to, to make sure it doesn't happen. Uh, mm. at the same level. I mean, France, for example, holds like something like, I don't know, 50% of, of reserves of, of francophone countries' money. I mean, so you don't have the baseline capital that you need to kickstart industry. And also most of the companies that actually mine in those francophone countries are French companies. So they're doing it for their own industrial interest. I mean, okay, you kind of fuck. So what, cur what, what currency, what current would you have to have basically? Because also one of the reasons why I talked about the sequester state was I was like, you're if whatever I kind of assume that people are going to create some kind of crypto asset, you know, alongside exactly. the creation of their exactly. city. And yeah. so like, there needs to be something that undergirds that, what that the value of that currency, which is why I was thinking, you know, uh, of the commodified, you know, commodity yeah. model. But yeah. so uh, in your model of Hunto, like you would have a crypto asset associated with that. Exactly. And, 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 it, and it could totally undercut, right. The Frank, exactly. like the, the, this, ex yeah, go ahead. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, th th this is kind of, I shouldn't even be saying that because that's, that's kind of dangerous, but you know, <laughs> um, this is what we could edit out. <laughs> right. I mean, there's, there's an eventual, there's an eventual, this is a broader thing where like, there's going to be an eventual reckoning when, when these cities start to actually be successful with the current Westphalian sovereignty state apparatus. But uh, that first thing about the currency is the first instance of that. That's going to happen. So you're going to have like these charter cities that are going to have, or they're going to have their, their fiat currencies, but also these crypto assets that they can leverage uh, on those crypto markets to get enough capital baseline to, to start producing uh, the industrial capacity they need to be productive economies. And that's what we want. We want to, to have these mixed economies that are fundamentally advanced manufacturing first. And of course they can be mixed. We could have like uh, the financial service sector or, you know, the tech sector generally as right. a, a section of it, we're not going to turn them away, but we don't want to create resort towns. We want to create real cities that people that are very low, low wage workers can come in and over the course of five to 10 years, build a life, get, get a yeah. living, you know, like get, and, and also just fundamentally, there's this idea that demography doesn't really matter because we're going to have automation um, you yeah. know, Balaji talks a lot about this, like, because we're going to have automation, we're not going to need that many yeah. people. The reality is that like automation itself and, and manufacturing industry itself is, is actually trending to be um, something like a new kind of uh, knowledge work in the sense mm -hmm. that you're going to need in the future people who, who are actually super hyper competent to build these super complex systems. You know, it's yeah. not going to just be like a bunch of people that don't know that are just like, you know, pressing something on, on a factory line. They're going to actually yeah. be involved in the creation of these things um uh, and the robot the robustness yeah. required you you i mean it is you can't have also a single point failure of a person you're going to need like a exactly. guild you're going to need like a guild of people who understand x periods you know parts of this like you know automated uh infrastructure 
Absolutely. And I yeah. think also, also one, people don't also think about how, the power that a consumption base gives you, right? Uh, right. Am yeah. America is powerful because of its consumption base, because its yeah. consumption base is so powerful. Especially now, um, yeah. Right, especially now. Um, yeah, right. You know, every, basically since 1945, every single time there's been a financial, you know, crisis, um, let alone the fact that that's how Japan and, and Western Europe rebuilt their industrial plants, right, was exporting to America's consumption base. Right, um, exactly. So one of the things I think is interesting because you brought it up is like this dynamics between, okay, so you have a, a, a you know, you have a charter city within the confines of, uh, in the con within a nation state, and then maybe it's, its currency becomes very powerful because it's you know, high skilled labor. I think of it, I think of like Ecuador and parts of other part, places where they dollarize, where mm, perhaps okay. basically you're, you know, you could see that the nation state would want to take on your, one of your, uh, you know, charter cities currencies and say, you know, this yeah. is power and like, that's your, that's kind of, you know, I, I, to bring it into biology, but you know, that's how multicellular, like they they think that multicellular life right happened, right? Like um, a cell, a single cell organism, you know, captured something, um, another one, and they created this like, you know, symbiotic relationship. And then that became the mitochondria, right? And yeah, like, yeah. And that power of the cell, it's like, that seems to be a pretty, you know, pretty nice trade off between maybe getting out of some of like the, the what would be a kind of a, a friction filled relationship between those uh, exactly. the city state and the nation state versus something where this really is an enormous asset to that exactly. nation state. Which, which is why I talked earlier about the fact that to do this well, you can't just go in there and just build an, a siloed thing. You have to be embedded not only within, you have your own state governance, uh, city governance, but you also have to be embedded in, in the state's own uh, governance uh, apparatus to be able to not just like to create these positive some relationships with, 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 with the political apparatus there, because this is not about coming in some, somebody's country and conquering their country. Right, it's about yeah. coming in there and being a partner in, in economic and cultural uh, political growth, and so so that's how we approach it. So, like for example, uh, and by the way, this is a good thing because Africans African politics themselves heavily rely on patronage uh, as a mm -hmm. uh, as a system. So, like mm -hmm. transactional a transactional relationship would not work. Like you can't just sign an agreement. Like an MOU doesn't mean shit. Uh, you know, sorry, sorry to say, it, like in Africa, no. it doesn't mean shit. Like if you don't know the person who signed it or who talked about it and shook hands with it and like ate dinner with them, you know, yep. you're not going to get your city. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, um, so that's, that's our strategy. And that's why we're not necessarily pushing so hard for that first, because we know it's going to be like a five year process of just like being completely embedded in those countries and forming those relationships. So for now, our, our first couple of years, we want to first um, build the community around the city and build a viable business to be able to survive during that time period so that we don't have to um, rely on just VC capital to, to, be, to be alive for, for the next 10 years. And so, um, so yeah, that uh, sort of delaying the whole patronage governance em embedded strategy because that's gonna take about four to five years to really perfect that. And so first we wanna build a viable business and we wanna have uh, the community ready so that once all that's, th that's left is the government side of things, we can just, you know, press a button and figure that shit out. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. We're, we're really hitting like two, two fifteen here, two hours and 15 oh, minutes. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a final question and you can tie it into to Junto and maybe it is, but you could, but I've now begun to ask people, you know, since the title of the podcast is grab the reins, how would you recommend young people go about grabbing the reins within the con, you know, whatever mm. definition that takes on whatever level of their life, what, what would you recommend there? Um, and, 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 you know, because maybe it also speaks to how you kind of gained your, you know, hyper agency and, and, and will to, to, to do this as well. Right. Right. That's a, that's a great question. Tough question. Um, so there are, there are a lot of, there are a lot of, institutions and powers that be that benefit from you not being able to build for yourself or for your community. I would say that. I would say first, start to, to look at the world in such a lens that you can spot those people or those institutions that aren't trying to, to get you to pick up a mantle, but actually want you to rely on them to, to do or accomplish anything. And because that's the first step, I think, you know, High agency is simply the realization that if you don't do something, no one else will. 
and and what what we've lost in our society is the belief that uh, we can do anything at all because we we assume that everyone else has already taken up those positions, right? That you know someone is in charge. You know why why would I even get myself involved in the in the thick of the action? I mean, this guy is doing this, this girl, this woman is doing that. You know, like what am I going to do? The reality, and I think this is the benefit of what happened over the last year, is that the emperor has no clothes, right? Like we don't really have adults in charge. You know, when you open up the curtain behind behind the curtain, you know, the Wizard of Oz, you know, it's it's just there, fucking looking embarrassed, you know, shouting into his microphone. And so there's a vacuum of power and competence that um, you can fill not simply by virtue of um you know just being privileged because you're you're here you're alive right now but also because you can actually do this you know it's 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 just a matter of choosing yourself first and and decide to to put your indent in the universe so yeah that's what i would say alpha barry thank you so much for for spending the two hours with us um i hope you come back again um yeah, so i really fun. enjoyed the conversation thoroughly um, everyone, thank you so much for, for tuning into this episode of Grab the Reins. Join us next time. Hit that subscribe button. I'll share all the links to a lot of the things that me and Alpha talked about today. Uh, but don't forget to grab the reins and uh, have a good day. Thanks, Eric. Peace.